Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee here with the, uh, another episode of the Plant Free MD. Today I have a very special guest, uh, Alvaro Campos, goes by the SF Ninja, and Holland Gracie, a uh, professional MMA fighter. Uh, thanks guys for coming on. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Dr. Chafee. Honored to be here. Definitely. Real excited. Looking yeah. forward to it. Awesome. Well, for, for those who haven't come across you guys, can you can you each give us a, just a bit of a, a brief intro on who you are and, and uh, what you guys do? Can go first? Or? Sure. I'll go first. My name is Alvaro Campos. I have an extensive background in sports. Primarily, I started off with breakdancing or breaking for about 20 years, and that's what got me into the whole health realm for my own knee surgeries and injuries. I found paleo early on in 2006 and seven or so. I started off studying under Paul Check for a good amount of years and slowly started getting into uh, different forms of physical therapy and nutrition, exercise science, and finally led me to functional medicine. And then I started competing in Ninja Warrior for a while uh, and then found jujitsu. And here we are <laughs> one years later. Nice. My name is Hallin, Hallin Gracie. I'm uh, the grandson of one of the founding fathers of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, Edu Gracie, and the son of Grandmaster Helson Gracie. Um, you know, competed, you know, all growing up and, you know, growing up through the black belt and the ranks. And then now actively pursuing MMA. And uh, I ran across to Alvaro through the Jiu-Jitsu Academy. And he's also my my personal trainer now. And I guess you call him my nutritionist. <laughs> and uh, I guess, you know, what brought us what brought us here is, you know, because Alvaro is an active carnivore. And, um, you know, I've in the Gracie family, we we do have a diet, you know, we follow the Gracie diet, which mm. a lot of people have heard of. And it's got its, you know, own principles and stuff like that. But, you know, I've been exploring this carnivore uh, diet and uh, playing with it. And it's it's pretty interesting. So I think that's how we kind of ran across each other. And, and this is happening. Yeah, very cool. And so have you been have you been doing carnivore yourself, trying that out or or just leaning towards it? Uh, I can't say I'm 100 percent carnivore, mm-hmm. but I'm definitely working in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely increase a lot of my meals to meat meals, um, definitely staying away from, uh, like seed oils, Mm -hmm. uh, canola oil, soybean oils, um, trying to definitely stay away from anything processed, Mm -hmm. anything that can last on the shelf for a long period of time. Um, so uh, I guess, in, you know, in the, in the Gracie family, we, we are, we were more and are more open to fruits. Um, and, you know, they, they do, you know, we do like a, a good share of veggies, but I've definitely, you know, since talking to, to Alvaro and, and kind of working on this new experiment and rebuilding my body in a way, I'm definitely playing and working more towards a full carnivore diet. Um, but I'm not going to lie and say I am a full carnivore. That's, that's this guy right here. This guy is a full carnivore. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Well, I mean, look, I mean, even even going like obviously you guys have to have a meal plan. It sounds like it's all like whole foods and things like that. So that's that's all obviously already in a great direction. And then just focusing more on meat and then less on the other stuff is I think is probably gonna do do wonders for you already. Have how have you felt in your own self and training uh since making those those adjustments? Dude, I felt great. I felt amazing. Um, one thing that that so we've always liked a lot of meat and I've always ate a lot of like barbecues, uh, you know, Brazilians, we we like a good share of meat. So that's never been so much an issue. But one thing I did find very interesting is I would I would cut the fat off mm. the meat a lot. You know, that would be something I always be cutting the fat off. And I guess that's where all the testosterone building blocks are at. You know, the good saturate. uh uh, saturated fat, saturated fat, and mm-hmm. good cholesterol, which will help build with you know the muscle mass and the testosterone. And so mm-hmm. I definitely find myself, um, my mental activity is very high. Uh, I feel I feel like uh, very clean, clean headed. Um, I feel like I sleep less at times, but I'm more rested and more well recovered. Um, 
I can go longer periods without eating, but still perform and not feel like I'm having like a mental kind of barrier or like a mental fogginess. Mm -hmm. Um, been doing a lot of bone broths, you know, definitely a lot of broths and I love to cook. So, you know, I, I, uh, I enjoy it, you know, chicken broths and, you know, beef, beef marrow, bone, beef marrow broths. And, um, you know, he says that helps with my ligaments and, you know, kind of, you know, keeping my ligaments strong and stuff like that. So I've noticed more shredding in my body, Mm -hmm. definitely more shredding going on. Um, nothing but positive results, to be honest. Weight has gone up. Muscle mass, muscle mass has definitely gone up. And that's, you know, we are looking to work towards a 200 pound, you know, muscle mass. And I fight usually at 170, but I felt like 170 for, you know, I'm six, two and a half. So 170 is, you know, it's a, it's a cut. You definitely got to slim down. And, uh, you know, I feel like if we can build more muscle mass with this kind of lean, you know, muscle high carnivore, uh, but still keep my energy levels mm. up dense muscle fiber, I would be a healthier 185 as opposed to a skinny 170. Yeah. Uh, try food. Went up fast, like 10 pounds in two months. All of those mostly eating meat. Yeah. 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 Damn. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really that good. misconception of people thinking that we can't gain muscle mass on a carnivore diet mm-hmm. is very skewed. Unfortunately, it's you have people like yourself, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and other guests I've seen that are clearly doing it. And it's a matter mm-hmm. of being persistent and knowing what you're doing. But it does work. We don't need to eat carbohydrates to build muscle. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. It against what we've been taught for many years, right? Through the gym, gym science. Yeah. And from what what I was kind of listening to you say about it, you were a high-level rugby player right you you mm-hmm. played rugby at a high level yeah yeah and you know if i'm mistaken didn't were you saying that like you're at your highest performance you were full carnivore yeah we, i would say so yeah from in my early 20s i was i mean as as far as athleticism absolutely i've, I've never been as athletic been able to put out as much on the field and off the field than when i was in that you know, 20 to 25 when I was just, do, when I was just eating carnivore, uh, after that, you know, I would still, you know, I had more experience at that point, but I didn't have the fitness level. I didn't have the endurance level. I didn't have the the same explosiveness that I did. I was still, you know, I could still play at a very high level, but I remember thinking to myself, like, why, why don't I feel as just superhuman amazing as I normally do? And I didn't know what it was. I was like, well, am I not pushing myself? I'm not training hard enough. I'm I'm now in my late twenties. Am I just dying now? Is that it? You just hit 25 and it's just downhill from there, you know? And uh, I didn't know, but then I looked back on it when I was 38 and sort of came across this again. And I was just like, wait, no, that's what I was doing. I was only eating meat. I was, I was just living as a carnivore, which is biologically what we're supposed to do. And that's when I've never felt better in my entire life. And so I just cut out all the veggies at that point. I was really only just eating veggies and meat, lean meat, and not that much of it. Started eating a lot more meat, a lot of fat and no veggies. And I felt like I was 22 again, you know, and I was 38. I was out of shape. I was sort of like 273 pounds or something like that. It just instantly dropped like 23 pounds in 10 days. And then just started like getting just shredded after that. I stayed the exact same way because I offset the, the fat I was losing with the muscle I was gaining. So I stayed, that was like, 243 every day for months. And I just felt amazing. And after two weeks on, on carnivore, even though I was like, you know, overweight and, and, uh, not in shape, I just come back from Bangladesh doing humanitarian work there. And so I hadn't worked out in months. I was just like, yep, I'm, I'm going to play rugby again. And so I went out and, and started, uh, playing with my, my team in Seattle, the Saracens that turned into the Seawolves, which is like the professional team there now. And so I was there playing with these guys that are get, you know, getting into a professional season, the first professional season, the major league rugby and, uh, having not run in months and months and months, I was able to just keep up be dead sprint, you know, do well on the fitness tests, even though I, I, you know, really wasn't fit. I really couldn't do it. It was all diet, but like my body, even though I was, had not been training all that much or all that long, I was able to be very competitive and just, I just felt amazing. So yeah, it was, that was just night and day difference for me as an athlete. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. 
for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. When you were in your highest level competing, what was your weight? What was your weight at on your full carnivore diet? It would it would fluctuate, um, but I was usually a, a, between 220 and 230. And it, it would be difficult for me to keep on weight during the season, especially because I didn't realize at that point how suppressed my hunger signals were comparatively to when I was eating carbohydrates. So there was a, there was a time there that I just I just was not eating enough, and um and I got I got very underweight. I was I was probably like 190 or something like that. I mean, I lost like a significant amount of of weight. Like my upper body was very slender. My legs were like tree trunks, but like my upper body, like you know, just uh, slimmed down like way too much. And um and I remember just just thinking I was just, I was getting to the point like it was like every training I was just like I feel better I feel sharper I feel faster I feel stronger. And then it got to the point where I was just like, every training actually like took me down a notch. And I was like, what the hell is going on? I was like, it must be because I'm just not eating enough. I'm just really not eating enough. But I was just like, but I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry. I don't know what the hell is going on. And I was like, I just got to eat. It doesn't matter if I'm hungry or not. And, uh, and you know, and every time I did eat, you know, meat always tasted great. Meat and eggs always tasted great. And, but I, I just never felt hungry in the traditional sense. And so it wasn't until later that I realized that that taste is a better marker and you have to relearn these hunger signals. So once I was able to sort of catch up, I was able to sort of maintain 220 to 230. And that but I was I was sort of younger. And so I hadn't really fully fleshed out my frame. But then when I started, you know, after that, when I started sort of eating a mixed diet, like I could I could go up to like 260, 270 in the off season and then slim down to like 245, 230 and things like that during the season. Um, but now that I'm back on carnivore, I'm, I'm consistently to around 230 again. And then if I'm like really lifting weights and really, you know, uh, making an effort to go to the gym regularly, I'll get up to like 240 and then it sort of still hover around two, 230 to 240. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because one of my concerns that I had brought up to Alvaro is that, you know, I mean, we do do a lot of movement, you know, we're always mm -hmm. moving you know, how can I get enough calories, right? That's always a thing. You got to mm. kind of have a caloric, you know, demands. And he was like, look at all like the kind of predator type animals. They all eat high fat foods, mm. the sharks, the bears, they all like those fatty seals, right? And so I, I was eating a ribeye one day, like I just had a big old ribeye, went to Whole Foods, bought like a two pounder. Yeah, nice. And then I got curious. I was like, how many calories are in a two pound ribeye? And it was, Literally, like I think three thousand calories, yeah. three thousand, a little over three thousand calories. So, I mean, and the most caloric part of the of the meat is the fat content, right? Yeah. So that that's why, because he was always saying, "Man, don't you know? Don't be shy with the fat. You know, mm. go ahead. You know, you're gonna burn it off. It's 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 good fats. It's 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 from the meat. It's from the animal, mm -hmm. and don't be shy with that." And so I started kind of looking, and I was like, "Dude, that does make sense." Dude. Like all the predators like high fat. Even the the grizzly bear loves salmon, which is a pretty mm. fatty fish. It is, yeah. Right. And I heard I heard for the most part that they eat the more fatty parts of the salmon. Will throw the rest. Won't even finish the whole salmon. It'll mm -hmm. just go to the next salmon and get the fatty part of that salmon, and then throw the the, the leftover of the salmon. But so they do have, you know, the predator, like the kind of, and even like we were talking about the wolves and the lions, that they'll go for the prime parts of the animal, of the kill. The alpha will get the prime part of that kill, mm -hmm. whether it be the liver, right, where it's got like all the nutrients and like the vitamin B12 and all that mm -hmm. alpha type stuff, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, and then they'll leave the rest for the rest of the pack, you know, but and like the orcas we were talking about, right? The orcas mm. will literally kill the great white shark just for its liver. It won't eat nothing else. It'll just take the liver and the rest of the shark, you know? So it's very interesting how these kind of powerful animals have a very specific kind of ability to go for the prime part of their catch. Yeah. And uh, 
Oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, sorry. I, 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 no, go on, please. No, that's, 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 that's pretty much, yeah, you, you can go ahead. That's fine. Okay. Um, I was, I was just going to add to that, uh, with the killer well thing is I did see one thing they, they, yeah, they're going after the great whites going for the liver. And apparently they also prey on other whales, uh, but they'll go for like the calves. They won't go for like the, the, the big ass whales, which I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, they're sitting ducks. I mean, a lot of those big whales, maybe they can thrash around, hit you with their tail, but they're not as dynamic and, and, you know, mobile as like a killer whale would be, but they go, they would go after like the young ones, the pups. And, uh, but they wouldn't eat the whole thing, it, which, which is strange. They'll go for the tongue and like the lower jaw. They'll just eat the tongue and the lower jaw. And then they'll just like leave the rest to like, you know, just float away. And they're like, you know, and the mom's just sitting there like, gee, really just for that, you know, <laughs> just like his tongue and that's it. So, um, yeah, they're very, they're very specific on what they want. And, um, and yeah, and most, most animals really do go for fatty meat. So like, like lions, um, will, yeah, go for the, for the abdomen, you know, you get like the belly fat, like well, that's where bacon comes from. It's much more fat. And then the, you know, intra-abdominal fat, uh, around the organs. And then, uh, they'll generally leave like the hindquarters, which are super lean and the hyenas will come in, they'll finish those off. And then they'll actually, because their jaws are strong enough, they'll crack open the, the, you know, femur and, and get into the marrow. And that's where a lot of fat is. And that's something that I remember hearing uh, when I was a kid about the Native Americans, when they would go hunting, you have someone just going off on a hunt on their own. And it's not like a whole big party that's, that's you know, you know get, getting a whole bunch of meat. They take down a deer, they would, you know, skin it, dress it, and they would actually leave the hindquarters and leave it up in the tree as like a, as like an offering, a blessing to like the spirits and things like that as a thank you. But what is that also doing? That's leaving the most lean parts that aren't really going to be as, easy to bring back if you're if you're tracking back hundreds of pounds of meat on your back and it's just you you know maybe you just leave you leave the the less uh, uh you know desirable cuts you know and it seemed to be those were the lean ones yeah and, and you know like when we talk about animals and stuff they're eating for survival right mm -hmm. they can't just go to a market a supermarket anytime they want mm -hmm. They eat when the eat's good, and then when there's no eat, it's like they got to kind of weather that storm. So I think they have this innate ability to pick, if I can only fit this much food in my belly, what's going to give me the most return, right? And I think a lot of times there's history in humans that we follow our ancestors, and there's kind of traditions and like meals and kind of different recipes that are passed along that might be kind of, you know, might sound unappealing. Like I love oxtail stew, right? And oxtail, but some be like, oh, oxtail, that don't sound too good. But then if you look at oxtail, there is a lot of good fat in the oxtail. There is also like some of like, you know, when you boil it down, the the nutrients that come out of the bone and maybe some of the marrow, that's all. So it's it's, you know, in my family, we we eat that a lot. But yeah, it's it's like uh I think there is, you know, um especially when you come in from ancestry and like believing what your elders, there's, there's certain things that are passed on that are for a reason. Right. And that, you know, we might not, Oh, that might not sound very amazing. It might taste great, but when we listen, it might not sound very good, but then when you're eating for necessity and eating for survival, as opposed to knowing you can go to the supermarket any day, and just buy whatever you want, you start to really, I think, get picky with what you're actually consuming and what's worth your time and energy, right? As opposed to just eating whatever, because you know you can go to the supermarket in about 10 minutes if you get hungry again or order something on, you know, Uber Eats or whatever it may be, you know? And of course that might not always be the healthiest option, but I think when you eat for necessity, you're gonna pick the liver. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna pick the fatty part of the belly, you know, cause that's gonna give you the most caloric and highest nutrients mm -hmm. out of all the animal that you just caught, you know? yeah so it's pretty interesting yeah definitely and um yeah so how so since you've done that i mean you you've obviously started putting on weight you started putting on muscle and so that that sort of you know shows that you know what we're talking about is is um a viable workable option for high level professional athletes which is which is what i hear often is like okay well i i do uh, different sorts of training. I play sports. I'm an athlete. Like, is this going to be good for me? And, and, uh, I, I mean, that, that's proof positive right there. You know, you're, you're an elite level athlete 
and uh, and this is this is working well for you. And I think that the important thing is too is it, it is providing lean muscle mass, which is the difference. Like you could bulk up faster and and just put on more weight by eating a bunch of carbs. You could maybe, but it, it's you're, you're going to have fat intermixed with that. It's not going to be lean lean body mass and it's not going to be lean muscle mass, you know, that that's then going to have to like slim down and cut down. So you, you lean down, you're going to lose most of that. And, uh, whereas now the weight you're putting on, that's not going anywhere. Like that's still lean body mass. That's just, that's just hard muscle. That's not going anywhere. You see that glycogen stores in people that eat excessive carbohydrate and they have that puffy look. It's not mm -hmm. that lean shredded, explosive look. It's that puffy look. Yeah, and it's coupled with muscle, and yeah, it may fool some people as far as size wise, but we know that's inflammation. We know that it's a uh, fat that goes on with the muscle, and then they have to yo-yo that that style, right? They bulk and cut, bulk and cut. That messes mm -hmm. with your enzymes. That messes with your adrenals. It throws your body off. It's really not healthy at all. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. They're constantly chasing their tail with bulk cut, bulk cut. The carnivore diet is, is you just exist. You follow the diet, you eat it. It's it's a lifestyle. It's a way of being. Um, it works for athletes. We have to we have to show it and live it and practice it and actually show that it does work with athletes. Mm -hmm. Some are scared because they don't understand it, but we're actually doing it and it's working. And we're showing it to more athletes. We have a bunch of different athletes we work with at the gym from different levels that are competing, and I'm putting them on these diets and. Nice. What differs from most people trying it is that they're not lab testing. They're not looking at their minerals. They're immediately flipping out when things become imbalanced, but you have to keep an eye on these things. Uh, Paul said, if we're not uh, testing, we're guessing. And it's true. So we have to kind of see where those minerals are. You mm -hmm. can't just say it's the diet that messed things up because they have what, 20, 30 years of their life of eating a standard American diet. They jump in a carnivore and then blame carnivore for whatever happened in the next two or three weeks. And most of the mm -hmm. time, it's not even that they can't do the diet. They can't sugar detox. They cannot get off the sugar. They don't realize what <laughs> sugar's in until they start cutting it out and having to monitor what they eat. Or you give them a, a continuous glu uh, glucose meter and they start realizing what's firing off their blood sugar all day long. And once you cut that out, I think that's the hardest part for most people is to get off of sugar. And mm -hmm. when they realize what sugar is, that's the hardest part. It's not eating animal foods because when you tap into that I call it mastering your matrix when you stabilize your blood sugar because it's not about deprivation. People have this idea that diet is all about restriction. It's not. If you're eating animal foods, we feel great. We had a pound and a half of ribeye earlier and a pound of skirt steak. We cooked it up and dipped it in ghee with salt, and it was amazing. The best. Felt good. Stable blood sugar, and we went to go do jujitsu after. This concept of red meat being heavy is is ridiculous i can eat a steak and then go walk to the gym and work out and be perfectly fine and have no issues uh, a lot of these diets people try because they're there's a, a there's vanity behind it but for some of us it was out of necessity mm -hmm. i had thyroid issues i had alopecia i had gut issues this is on a paleo diet still mm -hmm. eating nuts still eating vegetables at the time and so out of necessity i'm like i can't do this anymore like i can't eat these things they're really aggravating me. It was almonds, uh, fake sugars, monk fruit, uh, stevia. I was getting acne. I have photos of acne. It's all gone. Everything that I complained of or had symptoms of, um, even autoimmune disorders, thyroid issues, all because of eating uh, certain plants that were in my diet. And I was paleo. I cut out most things for a long time. And when I went fully carnivore, skin cleared up, you get shredded. Veins are popping out all over the place naturally. But more importantly, feel good. You have this higher level of energy and you emanate it and people are attracted to that. It's scary though for some of the new clients because I've asked, actually lost some clients that have their cognitive dissonance and this seems too radical for some people. But for the most part, I've had a great, it's, it's good for my career because I, I have a lot of transformations, not just through physiques, which is really important, but uh, reversing autoimmune disorders, reversing things that their doctors are supposed to be doing and a trainer slash nutritionist is doing it um, almost instantly it happens. It does it itself. The body knows what to do when you give it the right environment. It has that innate response. We just have to create the lane and remove the interferences when those are gone and you're on a carnivore diet, you feel great. Um, and so that's one of the fact there was thing that he was telling me, like when he first started talking, he's like, all the things that are going to make you sick are somehow plant-based, hmm. right? The soybean oil, the canola, all of it is somehow coming from a plant, Mm -hmm. It's not really coming from a meat or an animal. It's coming from the plant. So then I started looking. I was like, 
man, all these breads, like you go to a, a supermarket, you look at, man, all the breads are like 40 different things in that bread. It's in soybean oil is everywhere. For you to find a bread without soybean oil, you have to go to like a specific market that's like, you know, but so it's like. I got him reading the labels. He's reading the labels now. And it's yeah. that I'm like, you can, everything has soybean oil or canola, or even if it says olive oil or avocado oil, we know that UC Davis did a study that 82% of avocado oil available is cut with other oils. And even some of them were 100% soybean oil. So if you have an 18% chance of getting a real avocado oil, that's like. I don't think you'd want to take your chances with 18% on anything in your life if that was the, <laughs> the difference, right? That's it's really low. It's a low bar. So I've taught them to assume that everything has some form of seed oil or, or industrialized seed oil, which is waste, right, in it until you can prove that it's not in there. And not to mention that, like, you see, like, a lot of the sicknesses that are happening nowadays, ADHD, diabetes, all these heart attacks, man, I've seen... I mean, in the last year or two, the amount of heart attacks and strokes that has gone up, like people I know, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know what it's related to, but it's incredibly, it's spiked up incredibly. I would have never thought 28-year-olds getting strokes. Yeah. Are you serious? It's unheard of. Never heard of that before. So, and a lot of these sicknesses, like in diabetes and, 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 and you know, a lot of them are pretty new. They're not that old. I don't know if this diabetes and stuff, and I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if diabetes has been around for hundreds of years. It seems to be a kind of a fairly new thing to me uh, in terms of the amount of people that are getting it and developing it, you know? And I mean, so that kind of goes back to like, what were the people before? What were the the the, mm -hmm. the kind of primitive indigenous people? What kind of What kind of problems did they deal with? And what were they eating? And I don't, I mean, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think they were dealing with heart attacks at the rate that we're dealing with heart attacks. I don't think they're dealing with diabetes at the rate that we're dealing with diabetes, yeah. ADHD. Kids mm -hmm. can't even sit still anymore. And then the parents are trying to put the kid to sleep, give them a Coca-Cola. And then they're wondering why the kid don't fall asleep. Mm. it's it's you know and so he was you know he gives me a lot of information or he shows me like cool like you know research and information about more like indigenous type people the maasai right you talk a lot about the maasai mm. uh and kind of like man these people don't have doctors everywhere they don't they're just eating you know a lot of you know maybe certain specific meats that they raise some fish you know some eggs they might have like a potato or something that grows on their land naturally, locally, naturally off their land, but they're not getting gummy bears. They're not, you know what I'm saying? Eating Skittles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Doritos, you know, it's this big, big, big money, big business, you know, trying to, you know, catch your eyes and make it all colorful. And you walk in the supermarket and man, 90% of what's in that market is, is not good for you. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not good for you. And yeah. then they wonder, well, why do I got diabetes? So, well, why do I got, you know, why am I having a, you know, <clears throat> heart problems or cholesterol? Or, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, man. It got me thinking. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it is. Um, it is funny when people say, well, it must be genetic. It just must be there. But, you know, we, we've been tracking disease, uh, diabetes rates for, you know, well over a hundred years. And in fact, the ketogenic diet was was found to be the only thing that could keep like type one diabetics alive in the you know late 1800s, early 1900s before we were able to uh, you know produce insulin and uh, and keep these people alive. So that was the only thing that was able to prolong life was putting keep people on a ketogenic diet uh, for type one diabetes. And uh, even with type two diabetes, it, it perfectly controls blood sugar. And and we've known this for decades and decades and decades and decades. And now we've proven that clinically in large human trials recently, showing that you can actually reverse type two diabetes, get people off medication, get them off insulin with just a ketogenic diet, which, you know, a carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet, uh, if you do it just meat and water. And so, you know, yeah, the, and the, the disease prevalence has gone way up, you know, just since the 19, you know, early 1980s, type 2 diabetes rates in America has, have gone up by sixfold, right? That's huge. And it used to be called uh, adult onset diabetes, because it was really only happening like people in middle age or late age, and usually alcoholics. 
and they were getting this adult onset diabetes. And it was, it was quite rare actually. And then in the nineties, I remember as a kid, there was, um, there was a news story came out and there's like, Oh, there's like these 10 year olds getting adult onset diabetes, but, but they're not an adult. They're 10. You know, how can they get a, How can a kid get adult onset diabetes and they have fatty liver disease, but only alcoholics get fatty liver disease, you know? So, and this kid's never drank alcohol. He's 10. And so, you know, they, instead of thinking about it and going, okay, well, what changed in our environment? What, what's happening to this kid? What has affected him that, that maybe has influenced this? They just said, wow, ah, you know, we've probably just not noticed it. We've probably just been missing it. It's probably happening all the time. And we've just misdiagnosed a bunch of, you know, uh, type, you know, type twos is type ones. And they just, so they just renamed it type two diabetes and, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, um, that, that of course is, uh, I think just a lazy way of doing it. And, uh, and since then, you know, you could, you could argue maybe that was happening before that, but since the 1990s, we've been very focused on this and we've said, Hey, well, this can just happen anywhere. And so they, they were really on time. You, you need pretty serious medications for these diseases and these illnesses. So, you know, it's not like this, this is just going to go under the radar, you know? Um, so then we were tracking this very carefully and the rates are going up and they're still going up and they're still going up and they're still going up. So obviously there's an environmental impact and, you know, saying that oh, this is just genetic, well, that doesn't make sense because our genetics haven't changed as a population in two generations. It doesn't work like that uh, unless you have like a massive genocide or die off or a you know, huge influx of population from one area to another, you can't change the, the percentages of these genes in a population. You just can't. You know, that, that's just population genetics 101. Um, and so, you know, that's that that doesn't explain that because these rates were much, much lower uh, prior to that. And, you know, you were talking about the Maasai and specifically with diabetes, there, there was, you know, we're talking about, you know, what these guys are eating. Well, they were eat, obviously eating, you know, milk, blood and, and men meat. And there was a great study. I, I think it honestly, well, it's the only one that I know of that actually compares what we're trying to talk about, which is a whole food meat-based diet with a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, because all the other studies, you know, uh, excoriating uh, meat or, or, you know, singing the praises of plants and, and more fruits and vegetables, you know, they're, they're, they're comparing apples to oranges because they're saying, you know, if you eat more fruits and vegetables and you stop eating processed food, things get better. Like, well, no, no kidding. Like I'm, I'm not shocked by that at all. And they, you know, and they, put meat in the basket with fast food and pizza because there's sometimes meat on the toppings of pizza. Therefore pizza is meat. And they're not calling that processed food. They're just calling that meat and uh, you know, fast food like Burger King, McDonald's, they're saying, Oh, well there's meat in there. That's meat. It's like, well, no, there's fries, you know, you know, uh, deep fried in seed oils it used to be deep fried trans fats. I mean, I was, I mean, Jesus, that's just death on a stick. And, uh, and then, you know, a big soda with a bunch of sugar or artificial sweeteners, which is not great either. And they're saying that, well, that's meat. It's the meat doing that. Well, there's like 900 different things in there besides the meat. And so obviously you can't just call it that. And so I said, oh, when you eat more fruits and vegetables, when you eat more fiber, things get better. It's like, well, who's not eating fiber? It, it's, it's you and I, uh, and, and we make up, you know, not point zero 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 one percent of the population, right? And all the other people that aren't eating fiber are the ones eating processed foods, fast food, and junk food because they don't have fiber in it, right? Because you can't you can't freeze things with fiber in it and then ship it all over the world because it just it gets all mealy and weird. So they don't they don't put fiber in these things. And so if someone's not eating a lot of fiber, it's because they're eating a bunch of junk food. Right. And so, of course, you're going to do better if you're not eating junk food, you eat less junk food, you're going to have less, less issues. So, but they conflate that with more fiber is good for you. More fruits and vegetables are good for you. No, no, no. less junk food is good for you. Right. And so a, a really good uh, look at that was, in this, uh, it's an older study. It's back from 1931, but it was, it was published in one of the top medical journals, Journal of the American Medical Association. And uh, it was done by the Brits <clears throat> and they looked at the Maasai and uh, their neighbors, neighboring tribe, which was the Akikuyu. And the really interesting part about this was that the Akikuyu actually intermarried with the Maasai. So they were genetically similar populations and they were mostly plant-based, but whole food plant-based. This wasn't industrial farms. There wasn't industrial pesticides and herbicides and, and fertilizers and all that sort of garbage. It was just, it was like a vegan's dream. They're just out on a commune, just eating tubers and leaves and things and fruits and things like that. And they compared the two 
and they found that there were massive, ma- massive health and developmental disparities. So the Maasai uh, adult males on average were five inches taller, 23 pounds mm. heavier of, of lean muscle body mass, and 50% stronger on average. And that the Akikuyu had a lot of other uh, serious health issues. They were, have a high rate of diabetes. They were getting uh, infections more often. Again, chest infections, lung, lung infections, or getting ulcers, uh, tropical diseases. Obviously, you're in Africa. You're going to be, you know, just complete, you know, constantly surrounded by by different sorts of tropical diseases. Uh, and they had a lot of uh, nutritional deficiencies as well. A lot of vitamins and minerals that uh, you know they, that they were lacking. They were all like, anemic. They didn't have enough iron. They didn't have enough B twelve. All these sorts of things. Like they still ate some meat, which is probably the only thing keeping them alive. But predominantly, they were eating this you know these plants. And they found the researchers found that just by supplementing the vitamins and minerals that they were lacking actually didn't improve their health outcomes. They didn't. They were still getting sick. They were still getting the diabetes. All these sorts of things. But if they replaced what they were eating with meat, sort of giving them more meat and giving them more what like the Maasai were eating, cleared up. You know, obviously they weren't going to, you know, grow five inches, you know, their growth plates are closed, but you have to get that in development. And that's so important for kids as well, is that you have to get nutrition right from the get-go. Unfortunately, you know, we we sort of lost our chance. We've developed how our our bodies can develop and and we can optimize where our bodies are now. But you know, if we if we came to this when we were two or you know, our, our parents came to this before we were born, like we would all be much bigger, larger, smarter, stronger, more athletic specimens, which which kind of bugs me, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get to see. I'm pretty big, man. I'm pretty big, bro. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing, you know, it's like, um, you know, like Messiah, these guys are like on average, like six foot three, six foot four, on average, yeah. right? Average American adult male is five foot eight, you know? Yeah. It's just a shrimp compared to these guys, you know? Well, yeah. And our, I think the obesity rate in America is higher than anywhere else in the world, if not it, top three. It's it's pretty high. I think they're, I think last time I checked, I think we were 19th for obesity, but for obesity and overweight, we're, we're pretty high up there. I think we're top, top five, top 10. Um, but there are some, some places that have higher, like straight up obesity rates, like the Pacific islands are, are pretty bad for that. But I think as far as the population is concerned, we probably food, right? have more. Sorry. Is that because we ship them our food? They're, it's not their native diets that they're eating there. They're eating the processed foods in those islands. I, I think exactly that. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, if you even, even go into like rural India and Bangladesh and China and Africa, I mean, okay. So I was, I was in Bangladesh doing humanitarian work, right? I was, I was in a very, very rural part of Southern Bangladesh, the Bangladesh where these refugee camps are. And so I was seeing how these people were living literally in the jungle, right? And this is in the jungle. And yet there's still racks with like Ruffles potato chips and, and like gummy bears and, and shit like that, you know, like in the middle of the damn jungle, they don't even have garbage waste disposal. Right. So like all these plastic bags, they can't even throw them away. They just, they, they throw them on the street. They, so someone will sweep them up and they'll like just burn these piles of plastic, you know, and it's just this black tar smoke coming off of these plastic piles. So like the, the air pollution there is horrible because they burn so much plastic. It's just in the middle of the jungle and they've still got access to fun sized bags of Ruffles potato chips. Like why? Why? They're so poor. They, they, they most people did not have shoes. Right. And so, you know, they, they aren't able to afford that. They're extremely poor, extremely hungry. And yet they're still able to like buying Ruffles like it blew my mind, but that was the thing. They're very uh, nutritionally deprived. They're very short people in Bangladesh, and um, you know they just don't have a lot of access to to proper food on a good day. And now you have this influx of processed garbage that is they're, they're spending what little money they have on that crap as opposed to real food. And it's just and, you know now these rates of diabetes maybe you know, because they're half starved. Uh, you know, they don't have the obesity rate that Americans have or Western countries have because of the abundance of food, but they have higher levels of diabetes and, and metabolic diseases than, than these other countries too, even though they're, they're skinny, but they're still sick. They're metabolically sick because of this, this crap that we're feeding them. They're getting cardiovascular disease. That's their number yeah. one killer there. Mm, yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah, yeah diet. Sorry, go if you, on. If you, they're eating a lot of carbohydrate with fat. So they're eating a lot of rice with, with fat, um, a lot of fried foods, but definitely mm-hmm. carbohydrate heavy. There, there is people in India, though, based off a class that were actually really poor that would eat meat because it was cheaper for them to have cows. So I actually have a couple of clients that I've worked with, and I can actually qualify this. He was telling me that his family was actually pretty poor, so they, it was cheaper for them to have beef than it was for them to eat the grains and eat the certain foods that people were eating. Wow. And they actually ate beef. Yeah. yeah. So there are people that do eat beef in India, and it was it was a poor people that were eating it. Hmm. And they, they stuck with beef. Believe Interesting. That, given that you know the cow's holy there, but he was actually telling me that his family was poor and they had to eat beef there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's but sort of most of them do get diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Most of his family has that that aren't eating the animal foods. Yeah. I, I spoke with one doctor who's from India and you know, talking about this is this is before I, I came back to, to carnivore, but all the all the research on fructose was coming out on how toxic that was and how harmful it was and it caused metabolic syndrome and diabetes and heart disease and things like that, fatty liver and cirrhosis, basically all the things that that alcohol would do because Fructose is broken down into the same byproducts as that ethanol is, that alcohol is. So you get the same damage to your body from those breakdown products. It doesn't do all the same things before it breaks down, but all the breakdown products are the same. And so it can cause the same damage after that point. And and he was saying, he was just like, you know, that's really interesting because, you know, back home in India, there's this this region, I you know, I forget the name that he said it was, you know, you know, over a decade ago, um, or was a decade ago. And he said that, you know, in this region, uh, you know, for three months out of the year, the wild mangoes grow to, in such abundance that just everyone there, just like all they eat for three months is just mangoes, they just eat mangoes, 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 just all day, every day for three months. And they have the highest rates of, of type two diabetes in India. And so like the, uh, the government actually had to say, had to limit and say, Hey, you're not allowed to eat more than like, you know, a couple mangoes a day. You have to eat all this shit too. And, uh, and that was just, just from eating, you know, whole fruit, but you know, mangoes, obviously it's not like the natural mango that, that we bred it from. It's so sweet now has so much sugar in it and it's very addictive. And that's why like, all I want to use mangoes. I'm just going to eat mangoes, mangoes, mangoes. And, uh, yeah. And so even then in the middle of the jungle, Steamy mangoes, they've got this massive, massive obesity or sorry, uh, diabetes rate. And uh, which is pretty crazy to think about. Well, it weakens your immune system because as your body's trying to clear that fructose, it can't make vitamin D. So the liver is bound up. And in abundance, we we weren't eating that amount of we didn't have juice, first of all. So we weren't juicing right. and eating bunch of fruits in one shot. And you weren't able to eat more than a couple of pieces. Most people can't eat more than a two pieces after a while you get kind of grossed out by it. but with the with the sugar or with the juice it's mainlining it and yeah. the amount of fructose floods your liver and that's how there's those studies that are showing that you can actually get fatty liver from eating too much fructose mm-hmm. people have this idea that it's oh good sugar but <laughs> little do they understand that it's, it's not nothing good about having fatty liver especially from fruit juice and that can correlate with what you were saying in the 80s because that's when high fructose corn syrup became popular mm-hmm. so we were eating that that was in all the juices all the prepackaged foods and that's probably why these kids were getting higher rates of uh, childhood uh, diabetes. Mm, absolutely, that yeah. It's the nineties. Yeah, well, absolutely, because they, you know, in 1977, when the USDA said that cholesterol was bad, saturated fat is bad, they all cause heart disease. You know, what does that mean? That means you can't eat any meat, you can't eat eggs, you can't eat the things that we normally did. And this was something that the sugar companies had been pushing since the 50s, which was, well, you know, cholesterol and saturated fat could cause heart disease. And if it does, well, then you want to replace that. And what do you replace it with? You know, Because that's our major calorie source is from fat. Well, you can replace it with with clean, pure sugar because it's just an empty calorie. It's just, it's just calories and, and you need calories. Calories is a nutrient. According to them, and yes, you do need calories. But um, you know that that was the argument was that just oh, just replace it with sugar. Sugar's safe. Sugar's clean. It's just it's just calories. That's all it is. It's just pure calories and and nothing else. And so just replace this this potentially dangerous fat with sugar. And so then when when the nail went in the coffin in 1977 uh, with the USDA fraudulently saying that the cholesterol caused heart disease, they took fat out of everything and they just replaced it with sugar because wait, you need the calories. So they placed it with sugar and grains and carbs and the food pyramid came out. So you eat just a buttload of grains. And, um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. And so everything tasted like garbage. 
because fat is flavor. And uh, <laughs> my my uh, girlfriend and I tried to make these like carnivore cookies with like carnivore, um, you know, uh, flour. You just basically like boil down like a big roast and then like grind it up and things like that and make like a flour sort of substance out of out of meat. And, uh, and so we were doing that and she wanted to make cookies and she was looking at this carnival recipe for cookies. And she was like telling me, she's like, oh yeah, this is the ingredients. And I was just like, okay, and how much butter does it say? So like, oh, they don't use butter. I'm like, do not listen to that recipe. Like that shit is going to need butter. <laughs> and she's like, well, no, it's just, you know, I'm going to follow the recipe. Like this is the recipe. I'm like, it's a bad recipe. Don't listen to the recipe. Like, like cookies need butter. Like you have to do this. This is going to taste terrible. It's just going to be like, it just tastes like a brick. And said, like, well, I'm just going to, going to try it. We've got these, these things were terrible. They were just so bad. I mean, she was just like, this is awful. I just, I wasted all this time. She was so upset. I'm like butter, like you need butter. You know, we weren't dousing this stuff with sugar, right? We weren't putting any sugar in it. So like it needed butter and uh, it did not have it. So, you know, that was, um, that that's the idea, you know, fat is flavor. And we took fat out of everything. Everything tasted like cardboard. And so they just, dumped in sugar. And so the amount of sugar that we're eating, like you, to your point, the amount of uh, high fructose corn syrup we started eating since the 70s increased by over 3.5 times. And the amount of seed oils we're eating increased by over 3.5 times. The amount of red meat we were eating dropped by over a third, right? And yet the prevalence and incidence of heart disease and cardiovascular disease increased dramatically and is still increasing. Now, people will try to hide the numbers is that these are lies by statistics, right? So lies, damn lies, and statistics, those are three kinds of lies. And, and so they'll say, well, actually, you know, deaths from, from heart attacks and things like that, from cardiovascular disease, that's gone down, you know, since its peak in like the 60s. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the prevalence and rates of cardiovascular disease because we have a lot of interventions now and preventions that we can we can see we can say oh when someone starts becoming symptomatic we do an angiogram we see there's a blockage we put a stent in we prevent heart attacks from happening in the first place and then we are able to you know reach in there and suck out the clot when you do have a heart attack and put in stents and things like that. We can revascularize parts of the brain. We can do bypass surgery on the brain and, and bypass a stroke. If we can't get, get the clot out or can't do anything like that, we can actually like reattach vessels to re to re uh, you know, to restart the, the, the circulation in those areas. So we can do amazing, amazing things now, but that doesn't mean that the problem is getting better because we're eating better. This is, this is what the vegans would say. Oh, actually, we stopped, stopped eating as much meat and saturated fat. Actually, things are getting better. No, it's that that the interventions that we have have gotten a lot better. But the prevalence and incidence is going up. And it's still going up. I think between 2000 and 2020, you know, the, the prevalence around the world has gone up. I think by like 55%, but the population of the world's only gone up by 45%. So it's actually, it's actually outgrowing the population, right? So it's not just, we have more people now. So we have more cardiovascular disease. Yes, that's part of it, but we have a higher rates of cardiovascular disease, you know, in that population as well. And so that's, that's a problem. And then we're, we're not, uh, we're not addressing that, uh, properly. I don't think. I have a question. So, um, I mean, isn't sugar known to be inflammatory? Mm -hmm. It inflames, right? It causes mm -hmm. inflammation. Mm -hmm. And weren't you telling me about inflammation leading to like, you know, certain disimbalances in your body and whatnot? Inflammation is a precursor to all these diseases that we're seeing now. Like all the, it's the precursor. So inflammation is what occurs first before you go to that whole roulette. So of isn't inflammation the exact thing that we're trying to avoid? Yeah. Yeah. And... And a lot of people will say, I mean, I've heard a lot of doctors say that inflammation is the root of all diseases that, you know, like, like, like you were saying, sort of you start with this inappropriate inflammatory response, your body's not responding appropriately to these things. And that causes downstream net effects that we then call certain, you know, uh, non-communicable, non-communicable, uh, chronic diseases, which I don't think are diseases. I think that they're you know, a result of eating the wrong thing. We're not eating what we're supposed to eat as a species. And so we're getting problems and that we're getting a derangement of our normal biomechanics. 
and we're calling that a disease. But you know, when you get exposed to lead poisoning, right? Where you get lead poisoning from exposure to lead, like the lead pipes in your house, that causes specific end organ damage and disruption of your physiology. So you'll see certain symptoms be like, oh gosh, I'm just not feeling well. I'm having this problem, I'm having that problem. And like, well, that's really weird, you know, and the doctor's trying to figure it out and taking tests and oh gosh, oh, we just don't know until someone sees like, oh, actually this, I've seen this pattern before, let's test this guy for lead poisoning. And you test your lead and it's like through the roof. Like, okay, well, that's what that is. But before we knew about that, you would just think, well, that's some sort of disease. And like, you know, in, in ancient Rome, when they had lead pipes and people were getting low grade lead poisoning, they were you know, they didn't know at first that lead would cause that problem. And so they're like, yeah, just people are getting sick. They don't know what's going on. And it took a while for them to figure it out. It's like, oh, no, we're being poisoned. Like there's something in these pipes. You just can't use these pipes. We're getting sick from these pipes. And so they were able to to change to change those out. But, you know, it, it, you could look at that and say, well, this causes this specific disruption. And we see metabolically, like this is happening, this is happening. And so here's a drug that targets that and sort of interrupts that process and sort of slows down and mitigates that response. So you can die slowly over 40 years taking their medication every day. But if you recognize that this is being caused by exposure to lead, you can just remove the lead problem goes away. And that's, that's what we haven't realized yet as a medical community, or just as, as, you know, civilization at large is that that's what we're doing now that that 85 to 90 percent of the things that we treat now as as a mainstay of modern medicine are due to exposures and if you just remove those exposures and provide the adequate nutrition these problems go away and we're, and we're seeing that clinically in practice and we're actually seeing that in in the clinical data in the peer-reviewed literature we're seeing that type 2 diabetes with autoimmune disorders as well and so you know that's you know where, where it always comes down to what i say is as i don't think that these diseases are diseases per se i think they're toxicities and malnutrition right so toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet like lead but different you know but we're getting exposed to something that our bodies can't handle very well and we're and it's building up and just like you can deal with some lead you can deal with some of these things too but if you're getting exposed this day after day after day past the point that we can deal with this safely, you're going to get a buildup of symptoms, you're going to get a buildup of problems. And people will say, well, it's not poison. I had spinach the other day, and I didn't die. Therefore, it's not poisonous. I'm like, well, you had drinks last weekend, too. I guess alcohol is not poison either. I guess cigarettes aren't poison either, you know, because you don't die right away, but it builds up and it breaks you down over decades. And you will die young and sick. And you will have you have, you know, decades of ill of ill health. That's a poison. That's what poison is. And so that's what I think these chronic diseases are, and also not getting enough meat and food and and actual food for humans and fatty, uh, you know, the 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 fatty acids that we need, the cholesterol that we need, the fat soluble vitamins that we need, and the meat that we need, and then it's bioavailable form that works perfectly for us because we have been eating this for millions of years, and that's what we are biologically adapted and designed to eat. And I think that combination. I'm just removing those exposures and giving our bodies what we actually need that will get rid of, well, I mean, will eradicate most of the chronic diseases that we face nowadays. To that point, um, when you're talking about medicine and people, you know, having to maybe use medicine to keep them alive, you know, to mm -hmm. like die slowly. Yeah. I was listening, I was watching TV or listening to some, you know, music radio or something, and then a commercial came on and it, it just, it, it struck me, it caught me, you know, I was just, you know, doing my thing, watching a little bit of, you know, like uh, white noise TV and the commercial is like, oh, is your kid complaining about heartburn or some stomach ache? Like they're mm. selling Pepto-Bismol now to kids, Jesus. like yeah. as if like, because, you know, like, oh, is your, you know, is your kid, you know, having, you know, issues or, you know, are you caught up in the moment and your kid's coming up with, you know, a sore stomach or heartburn, you know, and it's like. Why, why should your kid be getting used to having heartburn? Yeah. Why, you know, why it's, and so again, it's going back to that situation. They're trying to put a little band aid on a problem that could have been solved with proper diet and that exercise. Right. And they're like, no, they don't want to solve the, the, what they're eating. They don't want to talk about what's being eaten or what's being fed to the child. They just want to put the band aid up here, throw some Pepto Bismol on it. I've never even considered that for my kid. I've never had my daughter or my, well, my son's only he's about to make one year old, but my daughter's six. 
I've never had her once say anything about heartburn, anything like that. It's unheard of to me. And now, like, it just, it, when I heard that, I was mind boggled. I'm like, dang, what's the world coming to, man? <laughs> like, now kids at Del Bismo, too? Like, yeah. it was mind boggled. These yeah, things well, clear up. I've had success reversing, well, not reversing, but I have a type 1 diabetic. He was born that way. He's taking 75% less insulin on a carnivore diet. He oh. is not American, so he has his family send it from France because it's really expensive here for insulin. So he's taking 75% less insulin. But when he starts dabbling with even just berries, it changes and goes right back. And we're talking about blueberries and raspberries, right? So mm -hmm. it's not cane sugar, but even messing around berries, his requirements for insulin go up immediately. Mm -hmm. It's very fascinating how it works for everybody across the board. And if they have issues with the meat, then we have to look deeper. We have to look at the enzymes. We have to look at the hydrochloric acid. We have to see what's going on with what they did with their previous life to recreate this balance or hopes of uh, restoring homeostasis of some sort. But we can't fault their previous life for what the carnivore diet is doing in the next couple of weeks because some people get die off, um, readjusting to sugar detox. But when you could get past that and stabilize blood sugar, it's it's a miracle. It, I've seen acne clear up on myself. I've had alopecia when I was younger from stress, gone, musculoskeletal issues, flexibility. You get flexible on a carnivore diet. You're not inflamed anymore. I still stretch mm. and roll, but the requirements are less. I'm not as tight. I've correlated different organ issues with musculoskeletal issues, the, the somatic visceral loops and nerve innervations. And you can have inflamed organs that are causing these distorted postural imbalances so when you address the diet the posture re-regulates most of these things that therapists are talking about like anterior pelvic tilt that's not caused by tight hip flexion that's caused by a distended belly because they're inflamed most of these postural imbalances that therapists are like you stretch your psoas and stretch your, that's useless because they're not addressing what's going on with their diet and their gut so i have my own case studies i i, I take pride in these things because it's important to have quantified and qualified assessments to prove what you're doing mm -hmm. and i get these people on these diets i do some minimal stretching but these postural distortions are re realigning just from addressing the diet because they're not puffy anymore so as soon as that gut starts coming back in um, and you remove the inflammatory foods their body just the the it coaches up that innate response and they they become more vital on all levels physically posturally all the bodily systems get better on the diet and it's fascinating because therapists are treating muscles and muscles are at the bottom of that of the whole totem pole of, mm. of these bodily systems. We know the limbic emotional system, the hormonal visceral can easily override the musculoskeletal system, but addressing the diet really does change these things. It's, it's, it's magic. I have not seen a diet work this well. And I I've dabbled with diet for over 20 years, 25 years. I've done the vegetarian, I've done the paleo and carnivore is the epitome for me with success with athletic ability as well as reversing autoimmune disorders and getting rid of inflammation and leaning people out most people go to trainers because they want to lose body fat but i'm assessing them and i'm like okay we have other stuff that we need to address too but the diet just does it for them if they're consistent it comes right off and melts like ice cream it's very fascinating and they feel better they look better it builds confidence um just the only thing I, that makes it difficult is the the ansel keys information that came out in the 70s and people's lack of catching up with the times because these things have been debunked and as mm -hmm. you mentioned with Harvard, Harvard pushing for sugar, right? They paid off scientists to, to blame uh, fat for what sugar was doing. But what's frightening is that in the what 20s, late 20s, early 30s, we had the Warburg hypothesis, right? And so he proved that these cancer cells were living off of sugar, that fermentation from the, from the insulin. So you'd inject people with insulin and see the cancer cells go to this. So he knew that cancer lived off of sugar or that sugar thrives off of eating uh, or cancer thrives off of eating sugar in the thirties already. And then we fast forward 40 years later and they're telling everybody to eat sugar. So it's very frightening and scary to think that we already had that information decades before proving that sugar feeds cancer. And then 40 years later, we're telling everybody prestigious schools are telling people to eat tons of sugar because it suppresses their appetite. It gives children energy. I've seen all the propaganda. We can easily yeah. Google 1970s sugar propaganda. And it's very fascinating. It's humorous when you look at it now, but it's frightening because of the damage that it, it did and it's still doing because people still follow the Ansel Keys ideology and the, the, the stuff that he taught during that time. And things change from the 70s, from the canola oil to the high fructose corn syrup to the low fat. And our physiques change, too. If you look at pictures and we see them floating around online, pictures of the people on the beach, 
I mean, from the 30s to 40s, 50s, you see this magical boom in the uh, towards the late 70s, 80s, mm-hmm. 90s, and now it's just mostly obese people on the beach because it's a reflection of of our lifestyle, which the diet is a huge part of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. And to that point, like uh, my grandfather, um, I mean, you know, well respected in in the martial arts and and jiu-jitsu community, and like I said, uh, you know, founding father of, of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Gracie jiu-jitsu. But he was his older brother Carlos spent most of his last years just studying diet and pH and alkaline and acidity. And granted, you know, like I said, we do appreciate some fruits and stuff in the Gracie diet. You know, they'll eat some fruits, but everything in balance. And there is a certain process. You don't just eat whatever at any time. There's a certain processing that they'll go through in terms of how they consume it, when they consume it. Mm. And one thing that when we're talking about here is that kind of sticks out is my grandma was like, every bad thing for you comes in through the mouth. Mm. Every, everything that's like, that can hurt you will come in that you have to consume it. Right. So that's, I think one of the things that's kind of raised to us and told us as kids when we're growing up is we value so much what we eat that we learn how to cook. We learn how to kind of, you know, make, try to make the healthiest decisions we can. And that's why we, I feel like I even value diet nowadays is because I would have this influence coming into me from my father, my grandfather, and my grandfather didn't drink. He didn't smoke. Mm. He wouldn't even hold a glass of wine at my, my, my parents' wedding. (laughs) <laughs> or, a, or a glass of champagne because he didn't want to give that image. Mm. And so he was very much um, always conscious about what he consumed, what he would actually let go into his mouth. He would stay away from anything processed, anything that would last on your shelf more than a few days, he probably would not consume. And granted, it's not a hundred percent carnivore, but it's that kind of, again, what are we telling our next generation, right? Are we just saying, go out and buy whatever you want and just, you know, eat quick, eat fast, buy this, buy that. Or are we actually saying, think about it, sit back and think about literally experiment literally with what makes you feel better and what makes you perform better. And like, you know, a lot of people today is, um, I feel like caught up in the tech boom and then the kind of, you know, they want to spend more time doing other things and they don't want to spend time cooking. So then they're getting eaten fast food and then they're concerned about money. So then they're trying to save money on the food. And if you look at it, all the foods that are good for you are more expensive for the most part, but rightfully mm-hmm. so. Right. And there's a more nutritional value um, and you feel better and you perform better and you think clear. So that cheap meal, you know, what were we talking about? Leaky gut. Right. And then how some of these foods, you know, obviously tarnish your gut line. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, I guess there's little microorganisms in your gut that are supposed to be alive and healthy that are supposed to intake all the good nutrients and all these kind of bad foods, like these poisonous foods that you're just eating every single day is killing that gut lining. Therefore, mm-hmm. now you're dealing with leaky gut and, you know, these toxins and bacteria are seeping through your gut line into your blood system. And, you know, now you're having heartburn left and right. That's just the first thing. Heartburn is just the first thing. But that's obviously letting you know that, hey, man, if you don't switch it up, something around the corner is coming in. It's just only going to get worse from here. Pepto-Bismol ain't going to fucking, yeah. ain't gonna, you know what I'm saying? It's only going to get worse. Now you need Pepto-Bismol and something else. And now I can't even remember the last time I took a medicine. I can't mm-hmm. even, I can't even remember Tyl- anything, Tylenol, NyQuil, I can't remember. Yeah. I'll rather literally, if I get like a little germ or something, just wait it out for a couple of days. Before you know it, my body just kicks its butt. The germ is gone. I'm back healthier than ever. I went the only thing I went to the doctor for is to get surgery because I blew out a ligament and then I had I can't do the surgery myself. So you get the surgery. But other than that, bro, I cannot remember the last time I went to see a doctor for any kind of medicine or anything. My doctor's right here. This guy's my dog. <laughs> I'm a student. Same thing with, with our doctors, right? We go to the doctor. We're healthier than them. Um, yeah. yeah. That's my testosterone. Ask if I'm on steroids. I've never taken any performance enhancement drugs. I'm almost 43. 
and I'm above. Dude, this guy does like people. 50 pull-ups, bro. <laughs> he does like I'm like, watch, I'm like, holy shit. I'm like trying to get <laughs> 10 or 15. You know, I think whatever. it's important to walk the walk too, right? If we're going to discuss diets, if we're going to talk about exercise, we have to walk the walk too, humbly. And, and as a student, because that's the beauty of science. It could be disproven and we have to go with that and be open to learn. So I also believe that you have to walk the walk and you do a great job of that. And we're trying to do that too, to, to live as an example and show that this can be done in a healthy manner. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's one thing if someone's telling you to do something, a, a certain diet, but if they don't look the part, it, it's 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 tough and looking the part is not enough either right you also have to have a little bit of smarts with it and be able to to share that information with with the people you're teaching it to as well being a health practitioner yeah one video that he had shown me i think that i had messaged you and told you about but the plants are trying to kill you that that youtube mm-hmm. video was awesome by the way it was super <laughs> nice. cool i watch it i share it with everybody i'm like yo you gotta watch this bro come over you gotta watch <laughs> and uh and it's super interesting right because um it just you know you talk about how everything living has a survival mechanism mm-hmm. right everything you know lions have teeth and claws and then but plants they can't run they can't hide they can't so they have toxins and they have you know certain cancer causing carcinogens and they have these leptins i, I mean i hope that's the right words yep. yeah and so it was it was interesting it was i never thought of it that way you know but then you started you know talking more and so i you know i was i was like it it does make sense everything nothing alive does want to want to die everything alive wants to stay alive and you then started talking about how no animal eats every single plant Mm -hmm. right certain animals eat specific plants if it eats the wrong plant it's not going to feel good or it could die. And you gave the example about pandas and koalas. And then you gave the example of that bird, I think in Australia, who only that single bird can eat the seed because the seed can only germinate once it goes through the bird's digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was that for me, that, that, that definitely made a lot of sense and seemed very real. And then you, you talked about one thing here um, about like potato skins, right? How like, mm-hmm. you know, or potatoes and like sometimes, and that might've been on a different, you know, segment of yours, but you were talking something about and how people had talked about, uh, you know, potato skins having a lot of the nutrients, right? And that's where all the nutrients mm-hmm. are at. But then you also said, yeah, but that's also where all the kind of harmful mm-hmm. uh nutrients anti-nutrients are at in the same time so with the good nutrients you're also taking a lot of anti and so that when i heard that my dad right my dad because like my dad boils the crap out of everything he eats (laughs) right you had mentioned if you're gonna eat this okay but boil it boil it you know burn off a lot as much as you can if you are gonna eat it I think you said something it's along to get rid lines. of some of the oxalates, but it, it doesn't get rid of all of them though. Yeah. yeah. So, and lectins, especially like it can it, like a lot of lectins are heat sensitive, but it, yeah, it doesn't necessarily get rid of all of them. And, um, and yeah, and some, some, or, or just treating them in general, there, we have a lot of traditional treatments for different plants to sort of detoxify them a bit and then to bring out some more of their nutrients. And sometimes that's boiling. And sometimes that's just getting rid of the skin, getting rid of the seeds like you do into, in tomato. Those and uh, but yeah, there's there's but yeah, but treating so them anyway. Been telling me, my dad's been t- oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. My dad's been telling me about tomato seeds since I was like a little kid. He's like, son, don't eat yeah. the tomato seeds. Yeah, and every time you eat the tomato, I see him in the sink and he's nice. getting the seeds out of the little nice. tomato. And I would tell people this, and like, bro, you're freaking crazy, right? <laughs> and then I watched that video about you, and I'm like, bro, my dad knew it the whole time, I knew it. right? Yeah. <laughs> and when it came to the potato skins, is like. So people would come over, but how's it? Like, that's where all the nutrients are. Like, he's like, oh, yeah? Okay, let's do this. Yeah. I'll make a dish of just potato skins for you, and I'll eat the potato. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have all the nutrients. And, also, and it kind of goes back to, like, I guess, you know, if you are going to consume certain things, the process about how to go about it to the best of its ability, right? And, again, like you said that, but I heard that very similar information from – my grandfather and from my father. And so these are like ancestral, right? It's coming and they are learning it from somewhere and they're doing mm-hmm. researches and stuff like that. And so it's it, it, like, that was a moment for me where I was like, yeah, it, my fucking mind went crazy. I was like so excited to hear that. So 
Oh, good. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's cool too that you, you have that background, you know, with your family and, um, you know, ha having that sort of deeper understanding of, of nutrition and just being very conscious of it, you know, that it is very important what you put in your mouth. You can't just eat crap and expect, you know, the best results. You know, it really, you know, everything boils down to what you're fueling your body with because your body is just not going to work as well. And there, you know, I mean, look, I think, I think a lot of people have done it. I've, I've eaten less well at certain points in my life and still competed at a high level. But I can tell you for a cold frozen fact, it was nothing close to how well my body can perform and how well I can perform both mentally and physically when eating a proper diet it makes a massive, massive difference. And yes, you can compete at a high level with a whole bunch of other people who are eating a bunch of crap as well, you know, and you're on a level playing field, but this is something that, that I think more athletes really need to get on top of because this gives this unlevels the playing field. You know, this is something that can make, give you a, an extreme advantage athletically and physically, uh, Legally, you know, you don't need performance enhancing drugs. You know, I have patients in their 60s and 70s that are increasing their testosterone levels by 30, 40% in three months. Goes up. On board diet, Goes up. You know, Goes and I, up. I, I, it works. I, I had one guy, <laughs> I had one guy, he was, he was like 72 and went on a carnivore diet. He doubled his testosterone levels, got into the, into the, the range that you would normally see in someone in their like 20s and 30s. And he was just saying, he's like, I just feel like a teenager again. I just feel amazing. Like, all I want to do is like lift weights and F my wife. Like, this is amazing. I was just like, this is hilarious. I was just dying. And, uh, but it was, it was such a great result because this guy's, this guy's just vitality, you know, had, had just, had really, uh, you know, been, been, you know, re, uh, you know, reignited. And uh, it was just great to see. And, you know, I, I see this in, in, you know, younger athletes that are still like in their prime, still competing. And, and same thing, you know, their, their testosterone levels like double, there's a, you know, there's a, some rugby players that play in the U S national team. And they were talking to me about, about their experience with it and not even going full carnival, just mostly meat. Maybe they have like a bit of fruit and things like that. Like you're talking about, um, here and there, you know, but, but still increase the amount of meat they're eating, increase the amount of fat they're eating and their testosterone levels doubled. And so you know, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just huge, right? I mean, you can, you can stick a needle in your ass and, and, and maybe double your testosterone levels, right? Or you can just eat meat and you, and you'll get yeah. the same result and it's totally legal. It's physiological. It's good for it. And it works in the whole system. The whole system is changing. It's not just the testosterone that's changing. It's everything in proportion with the testosterone is changing and developing as well. And so this is, this is a, a healthy, massive advantage. And so for, for athletes, especially, I'm just trying to like, just really pump this horn. This is like, guys, you're, you are missing out on a huge advantage uh, in, in your sport. And it's sustainable. Right. Yes. You look at the history of these people that are doing performance enhancers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there comes a day where, you know, judgment day, right. Where it's like, all right, man. And a lot of them, you know, a couple of them kind of, I'm not going to say no names, but you know, dealing with all these kind of bacterial infections, they're having, you know, stomach and gut problems. You're and, seeing H. pylori. You know, you're seeing it. Oh, these guys I are young. Bacteria. These guys are, you know, Can 28 infections in these guys. Say seven, and these guys look like specimens. Yeah. They look the part. But they're literally rotting from the inside out mm -hmm. with with these common bacteria and parasites that we see in people, but in abundance because they have a dysbiosis. They're not eating properly. They're doing steroids, pedal to the metal. It's and it's, it's, fumes it's a, yeah, out. it's a short lived victory, right? Yeah, yeah, they're gonna maybe get the gold medal today, you know. Yeah, yeah maybe they're gonna get a nice little paycheck today, but then a lot of them die off at forty years old, heart yeah. attack, boom. You know, I mean. So the use of PEDs and, and and a lot of these you know steroids and I mean there is there is a price to pay and I mean some mm -hmm. people are are open to that and are willing to kind of make that deal right with the mm -hmm. devil kind of those yeah you know whatever forget if I die at forty years old and then or if you know that's a possibility but I want I want the glory now mm -hmm. but I, I mean then you got to kind of put it, put it on the line but you know I, I always see a long life for myself you know mm -hmm. so I want of course enjoy many gold medals. I want nice victories. I want the accolades. I definitely want a lot of, you know, those things, those things are, they make you feel good. One of the best feelings in the world is to overcome any adversity on tournament day or fight day. Mm -hmm. These are the, some of the best feelings that a person can feel, right? Winning the championship or winning 
but at the same time, it's like, you know, knowing, and, and this is something that we talk about because I, I don't want to use performance enhancing drugs and I don't plan on using PEDs. I haven't yet. And I, I don't plan on doing it and, you know, maybe have a lost a couple, you know, couple tournaments because of that, or, you know, a couple of fight, maybe, you know, but there is going to be a day where I am going to come back and I'm going to write all these things wrongs, you know, in terms of, you know, set, you know, set, set the bar to where like, Hey, it's going to prove the point where you can be very happy. You can be very successful. And I even think for people that use PEDs at some core, somewhere in the core, there is a weakness in their mentality to even that to where they even have to use the PED. Something in them is saying that you're not enough. You're never going to be enough. And you're going to have to, you know, and that's where I'm going to look to beat these guys Mm. is when you go eye to eye and you really know that you're the truth. I think there comes a moment in time where it doesn't matter what you have in your system, bro. We're going to smash you. We're going to fucking smash you. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that kind of thing. And uh, you might, you might, you know, win one, you might win two, but we're going to be the last ones laughing here. I Mm -hmm. I swear to God. (laughs) That's just so that's yeah. why I'm going the extra level to, you know, find ways to get the optimalness because, you know, you know, you have to make some changes and adjustments when things aren't really going exactly how you envision it. So you go back to the drawing board. Alvaro is one of these with a carnivore diet and then, you know, educating me a little bit more about how meat fats are good for you. And, you know, how, like you was saying, not just bloating up because, yeah, I could eat a pasta and be 205 right now. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not real that's fucking balloon weight that's that's you know and at the same time i don't want i got two kids i'm not trying to get no bacteria infections i'm not trying to die at 40 years old you know i want man i want i want to live i want to see my kids have kids but at the same time be a world champ be a champion live as a champion all the way through not just as a 25 year old or but as a 40 year old as a 50 year old 60 year old be like your friend over there 72 just want to fight fucking eat baby let's go (laughs) (laughs) you know what i'm saying yeah so yeah yeah, well you know there was a there was a uh guy i was talking to dr sean amaro he's a great guy and um i'll be releasing that episode um in the next couple weeks and i don't know when this is coming out but we'll see how that how the timing comes out it might be out by the time this comes out but he um uh, he's a great guy. He's an, you know, he's, he's, you know, big fan of the carnivore diet and, and specifically getting rid of visceral fat. And he's saying that, that that's a major driver for disease and cancer and all these other sorts of things, just having more visceral fat and that carnivore diet is like the best dietary measure and really the best thing to get rid of that. And then on top of that, you want to do like high intensity exercises, like sprinting, like, you know, like, you know, like rolling, fighting and, and lifting, like just these big high intensity workouts that that just like strips that that out of there and it's really good uh for removing disease and he was saying we were talking about longevity and the fact that the human body is designed to live 120 years on average you know should just get there anyway based on the length of our telomeres and if you're working out and you're pushing yourself doing these sorts of things that will actually help your telomeres and they'll actually lengthen those out and you actually probably go longer than that and he was saying that he predicts like in the future that the top professional athletes will probably be in like their 50s and 60s, right? Because if you're eating a carnivore diet, if you're eating what you're supposed to eat and your body's not breaking down and you're still maintaining that that physical stature and that and that athletic performance you can put out and you've got 45 years of experience in that sport, like no one's messing with you. No one, you know? And, um, you know, I, I sort of thought it was, it was kind of funny thinking of like, you know, 60 year old, like running back, you know, just getting just laced by like linebackers and things. But at the same time, if your body, if you're, if you're not, you know, aging, premium, like, you know, the only reason I'm not playing rugby right now is, is because you know, like my I have arthritis on my kneecap and it just flakes off cartilage and my knee blows up every time I sprint. So I'm trying to rehab that, but like, the day that I can sprint without my knee blowing up, like I will be on that field. And, um, you know, even with my schedule, like my schedule is ridiculous. I will, I will make time for this, you know, because that's just, that's just, you know, in my heart, I just want to just go out and just smash people. Like it's still there. And like, I, you know, and so, you know, and like physically I feel amazing. Like I can go hours in the gym, no problem. Like I can sprint stairs all day. I can just keep and that for some reason doesn't blow up my knee, but I just, 
as soon as I'm running on the flat, the stupid thing blows up. And so that that's the only limitation. Um, but you know, I'm 43. I feel better than I have when I was in my late twenties playing at a high level, you know, and my body works. And so it makes sense, you know, so me having, you know, 25 years of rugby experience, that's going to, that's going to mean something on the field, especially if my body works the way it could. And, you know, I think back to, uh, Alexander the great, you know, he had, he inherited his army, uh, from his, his father. And he was like Philip King Philip. And, um, and so this was already a very tried, true and tested army. And, he said a lot, a lot of these guys, uh, that were in his army. So he was like 22 when he's like taking over the whole known world, but his troops were anywhere from 20 to 60. Right. So you got 60 year old dudes with 13 foot steel spears just out on the front lines, just lacing people. And these guys had a 50 to one kill ratio. Right. And so, I mean, it was just, it was just crazy. I mean, they were just destroying these, these armies and, and one of his generals, I believe the guy was uh, 78 and he was head of one of his, his wings of cavalry. And he was so this is this is not like they're sitting in a tent drawing up plans going, yeah, go do it. Back then, the generals were at the head of the line. And so this guy was in charge of the cavalry, leading the charge at 78, swinging a sword, wearing full armor, just just axing people. <laughs> right. And, you know, you think about this. This guy's got 65 years of killing experience. You know, he was probably just, you know, death on wheels out there. And, uh, you know, maybe at 78, he's slowing down a bit, you you would expect, but he's still out there doing it. And he's doing it well enough that he's not dying, you know, like his, because they were going battle after battle after battle. And this guy was was still in it till the end. I think he I think he probably survived Alexander the Great. Um, but that was it. I mean, that's that's a testament to what the human body is capable of. And, you know, doing extreme, you know, sports and physical endeavors into into what we consider late age, but really isn't. It's actually middle age. And when you're in your middle age, you should be at the peak and height of your production and performance because you have the decades of experience and your body still works. And so, you know, you get the nutrition right, you get the lifestyle right, you get that part right. You could easily be doing this and competing at an extremely high level into your 50s and 60s. And, you know, barring any sort of, you know, uh, like, you know, my injuries that just sort of just holding me back, you know, your body's going to keep working. And then you having just those decades of experience, you know, no one's going to touch you. Yeah, I believe it, man. I'm a firm believer in that. And thank you for sharing that story, dude. That's, that's motivation right here. Yeah. Let's go, baby. Let's go. <laughs> But yeah, I really believe it's, you know, mind, the mind, you know, having the mentality and it all starts in the mind, you know, to make the right decisions, to eat the good foods, to carry yourself a certain way, to prepare yourself a certain way. That's all going to be decided up in here. You know, what you eat, decided up in here, you know, uh, what, how you train, it all starts. Well, who do I listen to? Where do I go? How do I train? That, that all starts in here, man. And uh, yeah, dude. So it's yeah. like, I believe, man, I believe one hundred percent. We're teaching okay. it to a lot of the younger athletes. So I, I've been working with some of his students and teaching them more of the movement and performance part of things. And they have a lot of life left. So they're very malleable. And and these guys are just going to be incredible because they're at a lower level, young age. They're already very successful. We put them on these diets at that age and they're going to flourish. And so we have the case studies now. So I'm working with Alan and, and some of the athletes he's been training and we're also working towards, I'm working towards going to the Olympics next year, 2024. Breakdancing is going there. So this is a new oh, sport. Sick. Breaking is going to be in the yeah. Olympics. And so we're working with Olympians now that are on Team USA, as huh. well as with other athletes. And I'm personally bringing the carnivore diet to that to that medium. They're pushing for vegetarian diets, taking folate pills. It's very comical to see what, what, they're, what they're teaching these people. It's, mm. it's scary and sad to think that the Olympic level athletes are fed this plant-based diet or they're promoted this plant-based diet. Mm. And so we're doing the complete opposite. I'm putting these guys on, on carnivore diets and we're going to see how they're able to, to perform. And it's, it's a big sport now it's, it's global. It's, it's in places like Venezuela all the way to Tanzania and Kenya. So it's very mm. fascinating how it blew up in the last 20 years. And now that it's going to be in the Olympics, these are the diets that we're bringing there. And so we will have case studies to present and show the effectiveness of how, 
because most of these kids, these younger kids, well, when I say kids, 20 year olds, they're on plant-based diets right now. And we know that they can gamble for a while, but eventually the body starts pulling nutrients from different parts and they go into this metabolic chaos as they age, right? You might be um, able to compensate when you're 19 and 20, but come 25, 30, it, it starts mm -hmm. catching up. And so they're doing these diets now, these plant-based diets, but some of them are not healing properly. They're, they're, they're having injuries. They're not healing. They're realizing that these plant-based diets aren't working. So mm -hmm. People are finding the carnivore diet. We're pushing for it for high level athletes, but people are finding it because they've hit a dead end. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people, uh, I almost say they have no choice other than to try this. And so when they hit that dead end, they're, they're more open to trying things when they have exacerbated their options. Yeah. Now with that being said, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, go ahead. I was going to ask like, um, when you, there is a difference of quality of meats, right? Mm -hmm is like there could be like a soy fed you know oh. fully grain soy fed cow locked up in a little pin with like 30 other cows or there could be a pasture raised right mm -hmm. and does this i mean you guys might know better than me but does that make a difference in the quality of meat and the results that we're going to get from a carnivore diet well, um so, so yeah well certainly certainly the nutritional component is different Hundred percent, you know, and we can see this, you know, we see like regeneratively raised, uh, you know, meat and eggs and and things like that. Um, you know, they they just have a higher nutrient component. I mean, sometimes like triple, quadruple, more. There was a there was one guy I saw. He was giving a, a talk at um, uh, at a university. I can't remember which one, but he was he was talking about his. You know, he had a regenerative farm, and he said like a normal egg in America, like the average you know, that would be you know um, reported. Uh, in the government statistics was like for folate, it had like 41 uh, milligrams of folate and his had over a thousand, right? So there was wow. a big, big, big increase in the amount of nutrients available. And, uh, and you, you do see this. So that's certain. We do know that we have, we have objective measures. We can say that this has more nutrients, it's more nutrient dense. Um, we don't really have any studies that show different health outcomes though. So if, if someone's eating like store-bought meat, like grain fed and finished or grain finished beef, you know, because 80% of beef is going to be on grass anyway. And then just the last couple of months will be on grain. We do know that that makes a difference in the nutritional components, but this, the, the limited studies that we have at the moment don't show any difference in outcomes. Now, the problem is, is that you're looking for specific endpoints. So what's, what's the endpoint that we're looking at? We're looking at disease, we're looking at average health and all these sorts of things. So is that, is that going to be different for like a high level athlete? You know, probably, you know, if we did, we don't have those studies though. So if you had a study looking at someone just eating grass fed, grass finished, you know, regeneratively raised uh, beef and someone else is just eating whatever meat, I, I would expect there to be a difference in, in the high, in, in the high performance athlete. We don't we don't have any definitive proof of that for outcomes, but we definitely know that the nutritional components uh, are different. And I think that you know, especially when you go to like the monogastrics, like like uh, you know, pork and chicken, that them being fed soy and, and corn pellets and crap like that, that that I think causes more of an issue. And you have like a much higher levels of linoleic acid, for example, in in uh, grain and soy fed pork. And so, and that's quite harmful. That's a, that's a very harmful substance that you don't want much in your body. And so that's also why I think that people no, no, naturally gravitate to more red meat because the, the, you know, cows and, and, uh, sheep and things like that, goats, the ruminant animals are able to, to break down those different toxins a little better, even if they're not used to eating those, those things, they just have a bit bit better capacity for breaking that crap down. And so it doesn't necessarily go into translate into the meat as much as like in pork or chicken or like farm raised fish, that stuff, just no one should be touching that stuff. And so, um, you know, that, and that's also why I see like people get a bit more sensitive to that as well, especially people with autoimmune issues. They just, they, they can't really do, you know, uh, you know, farm, like, uh, you know, feedlot pig or chicken or things like that. They, they will get an, an autoimmune response. And so they really have to stick more to the red meats. Some people, well, a lot of, a lot of people on a, with autoimmune issues even will actually 
put things into like remission just on red meat, even just, you know, grain finished red meat. But some people are a bit more sensitive. They really do have to stick to like the grass fed, grass finished stuff. And, um, you know, as you just see, but, you know, you'll eat less, I think, you know, when I was, when I had a regeneratively raised 10 year old cow, it tasted way better, by the way, just had much more beefy flavors, just all those nutrients. I could just taste that. And I was like, this is the only thing I want to eat. And I felt supercharged, it's like seriously, like just teeming with life and energy when I ate this stuff and I ate far less and I didn't need to eat as much fat. It was very, it was very lean. There's fat on the outside, but there wasn't any, you know, uh, marbling. And I just felt amazing. And so I found that I just wasn't as hungry because you're, you're, you know, your body goes after nutrients more than it does calories. It wants, so when my body was satisfied with the nutrients it was getting, it was like, yeah, we don't need to eat anymore. So I was eating actually much less. And I think that was a direct result of the, how much nutrient, you know, the nutrient density that was in this food. And so that may be a bit why we don't see too many differences in, uh, you know, outcome is because, well, maybe you just naturally will just eat more of the less nutritious meat. And so you'll, you'll even that out, you'll end up getting the same nutrients. Whereas like, well, maybe I don't need to eat as much. Maybe if you did a study saying you're eating the exact same amount of one or the other, maybe that would have different outcomes, but there, there is certainly a different in difference in nutritional composition. And so I think that if, if someone is, is, trying to compete at a high level or just trying to optimize their health that might, and they can afford it because not everyone can, then that's maybe something that they should think about. But for most people, it, it seems to be just fine. Like you'll, you'll still achieve extremely good health, if not optimal health and uh, on, on just store-bought meat. And, um, and it's certainly going to be better than anything else you're going to eat. So it's already either, either way, if that's the only thing you can get, I mean, I, that's mostly what I eat is just Costco beef. And, you know, when I get grass fed stuff, I mean, I, I certainly enjoy that, but, um, it's not as, it's not as, uh, available here where I'm at. And so, you where, know, where are you? Are you in Australia? Yeah. In Perth. So over on the West coast. And so, you know, you really have to, you can buy direct sort of from these regenerative farms, but a lot of them are on, on the East coast, at least the ones I'm aware of. And so I'm trying to sort of figure out a way to like just ship a, a pallet of, of, uh, stuff over here, but it's, you know, it's a bit of a bitch going across the whole continent. They have Costco's over there. <laughs> they, dude, so I I uh, I almost didn't move here because they didn't have a Costco. I was just like, I'm not doing that. You know, like I I was like, I grew up in I grew up uh, you know Southern California, but then we moved up to Kirkland, Washington when I was uh, ten, which is where the first Costco is, right? So Kirkland Signature, like that's the, so it was like two miles from my house was the first Costco, and. Um, and so I've been going there forever. And like, I just, I just rely on this. And I like lived in Europe for a while and they didn't have a Costco. They didn't have Amazon. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not living like a, like a peasant anymore. You know, I'm just not dealing with that. <laughs> and so when I got back and I was looking, I was like, you know, I got a, uh, I got, you know, a job over here in Perth and I was like, oh, okay. So it's set to move. It was like, it was like a month before I was going to move down here. And all of a sudden I thought it was just like, it was like, okay, so how am I going to do this? Well, you know, I'll just go down and, you know, I'll find a place to, you know, I'll stay in an Airbnb for a couple of weeks. I'll find a place to, you know, to live and, uh, you know, rent a place. And then, um, what do I need? I'll just outfit it. I'll just go to Costco, get furniture, get a bed, get my meat there and uh, everything should be fine. And then I was thought like, wait a minute, do they even have a Costco? Like surely, you know, this is a first world country, you know, it's a major city, like they must have a Costco. So I looked it up and, and there were Costco's in other parts and other major cities in Australia, but there wasn't one in Perth. I'm like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Like I was like trying to think of options. Like, can I switch jobs? Can I get a different contract in a different part of Australia? Or would I just not go down there? Because I was this close to just being like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, the, I did end up coming down because I saw that they were in, in the process of building a Costco. So I was like, okay, all right. It, it's <laughs> already started. Ground has broken. So, ostensibly within a year, this should, this should happen. But I can tell you, it was not a happy year for me. It was really annoying. <laughs> like not having that. And it was like, Once you get used to Costco, man, it's yeah. hard. To, it's hard not to have Costco yeah. around. I mean, once you're used it's to it's definitely first world problems. You know what I mean? But like, you know, I can, I can, you know, this is like directly coming out from Bangladesh and I'm, I'm complaining about not having a Costco after like living in a refugee camp and things like that where people don't have shoes. And I'm just like, Oh, I don't have a, I don't have my mega superstore. That's, that's, utterly convenient <laughs> for me 
but you know, it does make a big difference. And then, you know, one year later it opened up. And so things have been okay since then. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on, uh, uh, those, those cows being exposed to glyphosate? I'm, mm. I'm getting mixed things on that. Can that really affect us if we're eating cows that are eating ex- things that they possibly exposed to glyphosate or sprayed in the area or what's the carryover to that? Can we get harmed from eating cows that were exposed to glyphosate or the grass that was sprayed with it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, it, it's it's better than eating the thing that was fed to the cow that had glyphosate on it, right? Because the, the cow is going to be able to detoxify that and get some of that out. I don't know the the turnaround on that, though. I don't know how much actually gets in and stays in the meat. I'm not I'm not too sure about that. But that's an important question to ask, and uh, and that's that's probably a good um, good reason to try to avoid those sorts of those sorts of things. Because yes, you know, that's unfortunately becoming much more pervasive um of a of a chemical that's in our that's in our food supply that wasn't that really wasn't there before the 90s i don't think and so it's um it's in our rainwater now they're detecting it in our rainwater Jesus. Like, yeah say it's in our rainwater it's 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 very bad for the soil because it also uh pulls copper out of the soil and most of our foods don't have copper anymore copper mm. is really hard to get even the and livers we- are having less amount of copper because of the the whole cycles of the grass and and the glyphosate mm. accumulates copper out of the soil. Wow, that's one of the negative things it does. And being being in the rainwater, that's that's kind of terrifying because that that's that's like that an herbicide. I mean that that kills plants. Yeah. That's the whole idea. It's in the rainwater now. Yeah, glyphosate yeah, in the rainwater. It's disheartening to hear that. Yeah, and no, so what you were let's... thinking about the corn and soy fed animals, like I go to Whole Foods for example, and I'm like researching, looking up the farms and. The majority of that stuff, the chicken they do sell, there's like 90% fed corn and soy. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the duck is fed gluten, so they do feed wheat to some of the animals. And like you were mentioning, people with autoimmune disorders will have mm-hmm. complete metabolic chaos eating that stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's the majority of meat that most people eat is chicken because they believe that white meat is healthier than, than beef. And most of that expensive whole foods chicken is all fed – actually, all of it is fed corn and soy. Mm-hmm which is extremely problematic. And that's the, that's what's available to most people. Most people are eating those animals on a daily basis and they're really uh, avoiding red meat because of the misconceptions behind it. Yeah, definitely. Um, are those pasture raised chickens? Some of them are, but they're still fed 90% corn and soy. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like a, a mind fuck when you're seeing the labeling because you're oh, yeah. pasture raised, but they eat, it's all corn and soy, like 90%. And then like some kind of, vitamin supplement that they'll give them for the last 10%. So they're not even getting bugs, worms. And then you have vegetarian fed animals, which are birds, which is gnarly because the birds aren't, aren't, aren't vegetarian. So yeah. they get these different issues. And they found that and there was a study of, I forgot the gentleman who did it, but they were actually feeding the birds liver and it was bringing them back to life after eating the the corn the soy and the vegetarian diets because the birds were getting messed up from not eating omnivore diet or their omnivore diet and they would reintroduce liver back into it and that's where this guy coined the term vitamin k for the what they were giving the yeah. the birds which is very fascinating it's like the people trying to make the vegan cats man you see the hashtag for vegan cats that's insane, man. Like you just want your cat to die, I guess, you know? And I mean, you know, we, we, we've known that. I mean, we've, we've known that for literally a hundred years, there was a study, um, uh, called, uh, Pottinger's cats and, uh, people yeah. looked it up on, on YouTube. They just fed them one group, uh, raw meat and one group cooked meat. So it's still meat. It's the same meat. Just one's cooked. One's not cooked. The cooked ones were getting more sick. They weren't surviving like surgery because they were, they were trying to, uh, do some adrenal surgery. That's and that's how they found that all the cats were dying. And then they found the one that they didn't they didn't feed them cooked meat and they weren't dying. None of those died. And they're like, okay, is there a difference here in the in the nutritional value of cooked and uncooked meat? So they did an experiment and they did this with hundreds of cats for generations. And they found that the cook the uncooked meat super healthy generation after generation after generation and that the cooked meat got worse and worse and worse after each generation they were less uh, healthy they were getting sick um the next generation the second generation they found that they were actually smaller in stature they were like you know like 20 30 percent smaller and they had smaller brains they have less developed cheekbones and um 
and they, they weren't as healthy. Their bone mineralization dropped from like 14% down to 7%. And then the third generation got even worse. They were getting even more sick. Their bone mineral, mineralization was down to 3%. And so they were getting like dozens of fractures. Like each cat had dozens of fractures because they said the bone was like foam rubber. It was just like, it was just so soft. It was so sad uh, thinking about these little cats with just 40 fractures throughout their body. That's just horrible to think about. Um, they and they were even smaller, and they had smaller brains, even less developed uh, cheekbones, and and they found that now they weren't interested in in mating, they weren't interested in, in uh, copulation, and the ones that did either couldn't get pregnant or had stillbirths, and so they couldn't make it past three generations just on cooked meat, right? And then they started feeding them raw meat again. And they got healthier and they were able to reproduce. But the next generation didn't go back to normal. It took four generations of feeding them raw meat to, until they bred back to where the, the raw meat cats had been in the first place. So there, there's epigenetic effects of eating stupid shit that last generations, right? And so that's that's the thing. So, so we know that about cooked meat. And now they're giving them a vegetarian diet. These things are obligate carnivores, meaning that they they that there's are almost no plants that aren't deadly poisonous to them that aren't that will not just kill them and uh, and they have to get these nutrients from raw meat and so the idea that you can have a vegetarian cat is just ludicrous you know first of all you're just going to have to supplement all the different nutrients you know and where are those things coming from probably coming from meat first of all so it's really not going to be like a vegan sort of cat and and you're putting them in a bunch of you know rice and soy and crap like that. They will have things that are toxic to that cat. And you know, so if people actually gave a shit about their cats, they would not do that to them. They would they would feed them what they're supposed to do. And this is what I ask people to say. Well, it's, it's it's just not it's not nice to to kill animals. I agree. It's not. There's no nice way of killing anything. But you know, saying so we, we, so we shouldn't do that. It's like okay. So what do we do? Do we kill all the all the predators and all the carnivores out there? We kill all the dolphins, all the whales, all the wolves, all the lions, all the birds of prey. You know, all these different sorts of things and all the snakes. And they say, well, no, 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 no. Of course not. I mean, that's that's just nature. You know, it's just like you know that that's just you know part of nature. It's like right, we're part of nature too. You know, we're we're not just some alien species that just came here and uh, and are just completely separate from uh, the, the biological laws of nature. Like we are animals and we need to to eat to our biologically appropriate diet. And, uh, and that is our nature. Our nature is one of carnivory. We don't really get proper nutrition from eating plants. We can't get even basic nutrition. We can't get a full complement of nutrients from eating plants. You cannot. And so you know, how can that be our evolved diet? We can't even get basic nutrition. And even some of the vegans will, will say, oh yeah, well, yeah, people were eating meat for millions of years, but you know, just because we were eating it for millions of years and that's our biologically adapted diet, that doesn't mean that that's optimal. It's like, I'm sorry, but you need to listen to the words that just came out of your mouth a little harder because you just said, this is something that's our, you know, that we've been you know, exposed to for millions of years and have had, you know, through selection pressures, you know, would not have been possible to do that if if this wasn't optimal. And we would have optimized to it. Like that's how that works. So if you're eating just meat forever, you're going to, and this is this is like 100% bio available to us. We don't have things that are toxic to us. So, you know, this is our biologically appropriate diet. How can eating something that we're biologically designed to eat not be optimal? I mean, we're, this is just a definition of terms here. Whatever you're biologically designed to eat, is what's optimal for you to eat end of story now i got a question in terms of vegans do they take supplementation oh yeah you have to support the vegan diet or can oh, yeah. they be a vegan without supplementation oh you can if you want to die yeah yeah but it's um you know it, they get very sick you know and a lot of people like you know some some like 83 percent or 84 percent of vegans, vegetarians start eating meat within the first year because of health issues. And so you have to take copious amounts of supplements. Um, and I think something that was like, it's like 75% of like vegans and vegetarians eat meat when they're drunk, you know, and it's just like, they're just, <laughs> it's just like, that's like, that's probably the only thing keeping them alive. You know, it's just like every now and then they actually get some nutrition. And so, 
Yeah, they, you know, the long term vegans, vegetarians absolutely have to take tons and tons and tons of supplements. I mean, you, again, you cannot get basic nutrition from that. You know, you can argue up and down and sideways all, oh, well, well you can get, nah, you really can't. Um, B12, you just, does not exist in plants or fungus. You know, I mean, maybe there's some, uh, you know, algae and things like that that, you know, you can get like derived some from, but it's like, it's not all that much. And, um, and it's not necessarily bioavailable either. And, uh, and who has access to this sort of shit? I mean, this is, this is, we're talking about what we're, we're evolved to eat. I mean, like it's just all humanity all throughout the world and all, you know, the different continents and, and landscapes we've been on, they all had access to this algae. Probably not, you know, and then people say, well, there's this, you know, the bacteria in your, in your gut can sort of produce some B12. It's like, yeah, that's in your colon. We absorb B12 in our small intestine and so do the gorilla, by the way. And that's why the gorillas eat their feces so they can get the B12, right? That's, that's how they get B12. They literally eat their shit. And so like, if you want to do that, I guess you could, but you're, you're, a, you have to do that, and B, you you have to presuppose that you have the right bacteria that's even going to produce the B12 in the first place. I'm not going to run that experiment on myself, and uh, frankly, yeah, I'm not <laughs> on that doc. That, 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 that was a debate that we're having in the game changers when those people were eating their unwashed vegetables and they were putting their own feces on there, and they're like, "We have adequate B12," but they didn't explain that until later <laughs> that they well, yeah. were actually not washing their plants. Yeah, so vegetarians have twelve, but they're eating, you know, the feces along with that. Yeah, so well, and, and the thing is, is that do do they have adequate B twelve? A are they are they supplementing? Or are they are they not supplementing at all? I don't know if that's that's the case. You know, people can just say what they want to say, but oh, they made the claim. You're right; they made the claim that, that yeah. they had that, but they were washing their vegetables. Well, and but the thing is, though, is that is that everyone in society now is so deplete in b12 because 70 percent of what americans eat is plant-based most of that stuff is processed garbage right but it's still mostly plant-based we're mostly eating all that processed crap all comes from plants as you said earlier you know and so we're actually eating a very small amount of meat we're eating sort of less and less certainly less red meat we sort of replace some of the red meat with, with chicken and so the amount of total meat that we eat is is roughly the same since the 1970s but it's lower quality meat it's not getting the fat and things like that so and and we seriously reduced um, our saturated fat incre uh, intake and our, our red meat intake significantly reduced that by over a third since the the 1970s, and so the majority of what we're eating is 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 still plant based and is not getting a lot of B12. B12 mostly in red meat as well, other meats as well, but a lot of it's in red meat, and so most people are B12 deficient and. The problem with that is that now, because so many people are B12 deficient, they don't realize they're B12 deficient because their lab tests say that they're not B12 deficient because lab tests test the first 2,000 people that come into any given lab, right? That's your reference range, right? And that's why two different labs in the same town can have two different sets of reference ranges. They're always slightly different. So that's just the average for the people that came into that lab. Who gets blood tests? Are these all well baby checks? You know, I feel great. Let's prove it. You know, no, it's people that are sick and they're getting, okay, well, let's check your bloods. You know, maybe it might be, you know, once a year you're getting just your, your doctor's visit. Okay. We'll just run a bunch of panels, but you're not going to go to like a deep dive. You're not looking for B12 unless you, you think there's a problem with B12 deficiency. Someone's anemic and they're having other sorts of problems. It's okay. Well, let's check your B12. Right. So that average is an average for people that are unwell. 90% of Americans have at least one metabolic illness. 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. And so you don't want to be average. Average sucks. Average is, is, is sick. Right. And so the B12 range actually dips into severe deficiency because you know, you can have a certain range, but like, you know, ha the lower half of that range in most areas in Australia and the U S and Europe and, and elsewhere, the lower half of that range is actually in, se in severe deficiency. So you can be in, in the, in the so-called normal range, but you can actually get demyelination of your, of your nerves. You can actually get nerve damage and brain damage from this, right? Because below a, a certain point below, um, was it 400 picograms per milliliter, I think, um, unless I've got the, the units mixed up. But anyway, below that is uh, you can actually get demyelination. But like in Australia, the, the range is like 160 to 620. So there's a big part of that between 160 and 400 that you are actually in 
true vitamin B12 deficiency and you will get and you can get nerve damage and demyelination of your of your nerves uh, and you're considered normal and your doctor said yeah well you're normal it's normal you don't need a supplement it's normal a better range is 800 to 1200 that's an actual range for good health but even the high end once you get over 620 well you're high it's too much B12. No, it's just more than the average person has, but the average person is sick and malnourished. So that's not a good, good way of looking at it. I have, I have people that come to me, well, I'm, I'm really worried about my B12. It's so high. It's like, it's not high. <laughs> First of all, you're, you're, you're just getting into the good ranges and you're certainly not high. And so, you know, these guys saying like, oh, well, my B12 is normal. Is it? Because it may be normal for that that average value, which is abnormal, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think for a second, it's going to be actually in the, in the appropriate levels. So there was a study out of um, Oxford in 2008, and they looked at, at, you know, people eating different diets and they found that, that vegans um, actually after five years uh, on MRI, they showed that their brains reduced in volume by over 5% on average. Right. And they attributed that to the low B12. And, they, and their B12 levels were like 180 or something like that. So still in the normal range, it was just low normal, but it's bloody low. That is actually, that's, that's actually deficient levels. That's below half of the point that you can get deficiency, that you can get nerve damage, right? And so you know, we see this in neurosurgery. We see people, you know, vegans, vegetarians, their, their spinal cord actually narrows and thins because of that demyelinative effect that you have, right? So those are just the axons coming down uh, the spinal cord. Right. And so that's that myelination all of a sudden thins, thins, thins. And you can see the spinal cord thin as well. So, you know, I mean, this is this is actually causing severe neurological dysfunction. Normally, if you have a normal amount of B12, you can last around eight, nine years before you start really getting into trouble. And because it, it can last, it, it can persist and, and you can use this for a long time. So that's usually like even the long-term vegans, you know, after a couple of years, I mean, you know, again, 84% quit after a year of me, like, I, I feel like crap, I'm not doing this. And so they, they cut out of that, but the, like the real diehards that stick with it, a lot of them do stop after sort of seven, eight, nine years when they're like, their health is just deteriorating to such an extent that they really just can't justify it anymore. And I think that the ones that make it longer than that, um, you know, may, I mean, I had a guy on my, my podcast, he was, he was vegan for 21 years and he was really staunch about it, but every now and then, you know, he'd have some fish. And I think that that was really important for his health and, you know, and taking a lot of supplements and taking a lot of vitamins. And, um, you know, if you're eating, you know, certain things, you know, that are, uh, that are less harmful than others, if you're very careful about it, you could probably do longer if you're taking a lot of supplements and things like that. But just, you know, as we saw with, you know, the, that study with the Masai and the Akikuyu, even replacing the, you know, the vitamins and minerals that they were lacking didn't reverse their health outcomes. You know, they, they were missing something else or they were getting direct harm from the plants they were eating. So, yeah. And I, I, I ended up talking to one um, nutritionist and she was finishing up her PhD in uh, nutritional sciences and everything has been inundated from the uh, from the Seventh Day Adventist Church, who started the field of, di of nutritional uh, dietetics and things like that. The first textbook on nutritional science at, at the university level was written by the Seventh Day Adventists, who are religiously anti meat because they think that it causes lustful feelings. Lust is a sin, therefore meat is a sin. And they've been pushing this for about 130 years now, and they started the field of nutritional sciences and dietetics in 1917, I think. And the first textbook came out in like, I think like 1925 or something like that. And that was, that was the original textbook. And that was, that was from them. And so, and they, they're still involved. They're heavily involved even to, to this day, even in the WHO, there's a lot of seven day Adventists that are on these nutritional panels talking about how meat's bad and things like that. They are very biased. They're vegans, vegetarians, and seventh day Adventists. And they have they have a bias against meat, and they don't disclose that, but but that's uh, that is the case, and so, you know, they are are pushing this and saying that you know you need to do this, and and and, and so the nutritionists that are they're going and learning nutrition, they're like, oh wow, it's all plant based, it's all plant based, and so of course they're coming out saying that you shouldn't eat meat because all the nutritionists say this. Well, of course they do because they're being indoctrinated. This isn't a real education. This is this is they've been 
propagandized. And so this uh, lady that I was speaking to was all plant-based, 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 because that's what she'd been taught. And we went point for point, study for study, just, I mean, literally over weeks, we just have these conversations that would just come up. And finally, the thing that got her was the, that point on supplementation. And she was just like, okay, well, what supplements do you take? And I was just like, and it just sort of struck me. It was just like, confused me. I was like, I, I don't. I, I don't take none. any supplements. And, <laughs> Zero. Yeah, exactly. None. <laughs> and she was like, well, no, of course you do. Everyone has to take supplements. You have to take supplements. I'm like, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. No, like if you're eating what you're designed to eat, then by definition, you should not have to take supplements. If you have to take supplements, then by definition, your diet is deficient and cannot be your biologically appropriate diet. Cannot, right? And and all of a sudden, she just, that struck her because she takes Bought loads of supplements at the time and all these other people. And that, that's what you do. Oh, you have to take supplements. You have to take supplements. And, and she's a nutritionist. This is what you do. Well, no, that you shouldn't have to do that. If you are actually getting, if you are actually eating what is most nutritious for you, you should not have to take supplements. And that was all of a sudden it hit her. And she's like, okay, I, I obviously don't know enough about this. I need to look into this. I need to start looking into this more. I mean, I, I just, I've realized that I don't, I don't, know as much as I thought I did. And eventually she came to me. She's like, my entire education was a lie. You know, it's like, it's, this, this was all a lie, you know? And, um, and she's like, I've seen it. You've proven it. You've shown me like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I, I don't know what ended up happening. She said that she in hospital medicine and hospital nutrition, you just have, you have to push the, the textbook and, uh, you know, where you can get brought up and get your license uh, revoked and lose your job. And so she's like, well, I can't do that. I can't push that on people because I know it's wrong and I know it's hurting them. And so I can't, I can't do that. So I don't, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I think she uh, went into sort of the life coaching realm, which you could, you could do as a PhD in nutrition, you know, that that'll hold a lot of weight, you know? And so uh, I don't know what, what happened to her after that though, but uh, yeah, she was, she was, she was quite taken aback by that exact point that like, no, but you have to take supplements and like, you shouldn't have to take supplements. I hope you made her a nice ribeye. Yeah. <laughs> well, <good. Yeah. laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've had a few friends that I've converted over from like vegan vegetarianism and I've like made them their first steak that they've eaten in like years. And they're like cutting it down. They're like eating, they're all like hesitant going. I'm like watching them. And I was just like, this almost feels like evil. Like I'm like making them like eat people. Or something like that. <laughs> I was just like, yes, eat this, you know? And like some sort of like, you know, thing. I'm like, no, this is good. This is good for them, whatever. But it just like felt like doing something bad and they eat it. And I'm like, that's the best damn thing I've ever eaten in my life. And then they, they're like really into it after that. You know, so like when you start eating those things again, I've I've spoken to so many people that have come from a, like a plant based diet or vegan vegetarian diet, and they say that when they start eating meat again, it feels like they just they just come alive, and they just have this whole vitality that comes to them. It's just like you know, one person said. Well, actually, several people have said that once they started eating meat again, it felt like they were alive for the first time in years, and that's that's always very very good to to see that in in person in practice. I have my uh, my daughter who's six now, but she because I love the barbecue, so she's been eating meat with me since like one and a half, two years since she can start chewing, nice. you know. Yeah. And then I got my little son now who makes one here in a, in a couple of weeks, but I experiment with him, right? So I got I cut a very little thin, very thin piece because he's only got four teeth on the front, but he doesn't have anything to chew. So I got a super thin, where pretty much if you just have it in your mouth, it's gonna melt away, kind of thing. Bro, you remember his face? His mm -hmm. fucking eyes lit up, bro. He couldn't get enough of that. As soon as that <laughs> thing went down, he's like, he wanted more. He can't really talk to you, but he makes sound. And he was letting you know, mm -hmm. bro, give me some more of that, like, right yeah, now. Yes. And uh, he's Picanha. So the little kid's getting oh, nice. slices of fat, and his eyes light up, and he's just making noises for more. It's my daughter's favorite food. She's six years old. The, her favorite food is literally little... Picanha is a Brazilian cut. It's the, it's the top sirloin cap. Mm -hmm. So if you go to like a Brazilian steakhouse, it's usually their, their main cut over there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's just, it's a nice soft piece of meat with a fat cap. So the fat obviously drops the flavor all over the meat, but it's so soft. I mean, Americans like ribeyes, but Brazilians like the pecan or the top sirloin. Yeah. But yeah, both of them, man, as soon as they, as soon as they tasted that, 
that if, if we say we're having begonia for dinner or, you know, barbecue for dinner, like their smiles are just massive. They can't yeah. get enough. Oh, that's Best awesome. Thing ever. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I was kind of like a you finishing thing here. It's like, it's funny that like, um, you know, that like what makes in terms of the people that you've talked to, like in the vegans that you talk to, what, what is their foregoing argument? What is like the, what is their main argument for being vegan? Mm. Well, there's, there's generally sort of comes from, from three, three angles. So like, you know, nutritionally, uh, environmentally and ethically, you know, and some people go, I, I, I think, and I think most of the, you know, the gurus in that, uh, in that in that realm, and especially the vegan realm, that vegetarian is probably more health related. Um, and um, but in the vegan realm, it's it's a lot of you know ethical sort of uh, concerns, which is fair, you know, and 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 uh, and all that. I mean, all these things should be taken into consideration. I think it's not just one thing. I think we should consider all these things. Um, but a lot of people are coming to it because of health. You know, they want to they want to lose weight. They want to be healthy, and so. You know that that's how they get. That's how the most people come to veganism is because oh, well, this is what's what's healthiest, and then they sort of get wrapped up into the sort of political nature of it with with the ethical, environmental sort of side of things. But they generally start with that uh, nutritional side of things, and you know, like the game changers, garbage. I mean that that influenced a lot of people, and they're oh well, this is the best thing to do is what these top athletes are doing. That's what I'm going to do. You know, it's just like putting on a on a you know, a Sprite commercial with, you know, like an NBA player, you know, like Grant Hill drinks Sprite. Oh, oh drink Grant Hill drinks, all that sort of thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to drink Sprite now because Grant Hill drinks Sprite, you know? And that was, that was actually the funny Sprite commercial was like, you know, he was, he's like, oh, Grant Hill drinks Sprite. Oh, I'm going to drink Sprite. And it's like, if you want to make it to the NBA and this guy's, this kid's like going up for a dunk and then it's just like hits the rim, falls on his ass and he goes practice. But if you want to quench your thirst, you know, drink Sprite. So they were saying like, it's ridiculous to do what, what a celebrity is doing think you're going to get the same you know outcome you know just by you know by drinking sprite or something like that but that's what people do they saw the game changers saw wow these people are getting this this result so i'm going to do that and you know it is to be fair you know if you're saying like hey this is how i train this is what i eat and this is what i do probably a good blueprint for someone else to come after and so people were really influenced by that and um and a lot of people came to to veganism because of that um and the, a lot of the reasons are predicated on, you know, Ansel Keys's work and those other works from those Harvard professors uh, that we know are fraudulent. Now this has been published in peer-reviewed journals showing that they were bought and paid for. We know their contracts are public. Their contracts were published uh, from the sugar uh, company called the Sugar Foundation, now called the Sugar Association, and they they completely dirtied the waters, you know, even, even Ansel Keys did other, uh, you know, randomized controlled trials, you know, reducing LDL cholesterol and actually, uh, heart disease, heart, uh, heart disease, heart attack strokes went up and he buried the study for decades. And it's, you know, subsequently come out, you know, and the, the people asked him, I was like, well, why, why'd you bury this? Was it, was it a bad study? Did something go wrong or whatever? And it was like, well, no, we just were pretty disappointed with the outcome. Like, you're not allowed to do that, Dick, you know, like you need to publish that, you know, even if it goes against your narrative. And so these things were buried for decades, but they've come out, they've come to light now. And so, you know, I'll, that's a lot of it is saying that like saturated fat cholesterol causes heart disease, you know, I don't want anything to do with that or fat makes you fat, you are what you eat, if you eat fat, you get fat. Well, if I eat broccoli, do I turn into a broccoli? Okay, what about if I eat meat, you know, that turns into meat, and I am meat, and I want to build and create and maintain meat. So I think I'm going to eat meat. Um, and, uh, and even herbivores, they actually do do very well eating meat because it's completely bioavailable. They don't have to do a whole bunch of weird chemical processes to it. And this is why you'll see horses eating baby birds and uh, you know, an elk and things like yeah. that, and eating rabbits and yeah. things I've like that. I've never seen that before until you showed me that. Horses yeah. eating baby birds because it was probably malnourished and needed minerals or needed some kind of nutrients yeah. that it wasn't getting in its diet. So deer, deer will eat them too. Deer will eat other animals. Yeah. When, yeah. I, you know, and, and elk as, as well. My, my sister first told me about that. She lives out in the sort of the, out in the mountains in, uh, in Washington state and a bunch of elk come through the yard all the time. And she was just like, yeah, it was like little ducklings. And this elk just, just came over, just, just chewed it up. I'm like, Oh God. And it was just this. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, um, you know, so, so that, but that's the, the argument that the vegans make is that saturated fat's bad for it, causes heart disease, all that sort of stuff. And, and so that's bad. But we know that's a lie. We know that's not true. We know that's been misrepresented, you know, and, and uh, by, you know, a number of different things. And uh, people watching this probably, you know, know my feelings on that. And if they haven't yet, you can go see my video on the facts about cholesterol and heart disease, uh, where I, I lay out a lot of the research and data behind all this. Um, so that's the main one. And, uh, and then, you know, saying that, uh, you know, that, that, that we're, you know, we benefit from it. There are all the nutrients you need, you have to get from plants and all that sort of stuff. You don't need to get it from meat. And so you, you can undo that pretty easily. That's pretty easy to, to undo. And then you talk to them about that and you, you tell them, I'm like, well, no, actually we've been eating meat for millions of years. In the ice ages, there were no plants. So obviously you, ha you have to be able to get everything you need from meat in the proportions that you need it. There are people alive right now, like the Inuit and the Maasai that are still only eating this way. And they're, they're actually doing better than most people. Oh, but their, their life expectancy is 60 years. No average from birth is 60 years. And their infant mortality rate is huge because they're living in the, in the savannah with lions and they fight lions with sticks and win, right? These are badasses, right? But they live a harsh life and they don't have modern medicine and they don't have, you know, uh, prenatal care and things like that. Um, they do have instant deaths. So that'll, that'll skew the age range as well too, for the mm -hmm. Hadza and for these people, they do have inf infancy deaths. Yeah. So some do make it to, to a long, fruitful life and then they have I infancy do. deaths. So it skews the age range. Another yeah. thing to notice too, is that with like the Nanettes and certain people still love living up in the North, mm -hmm. a lot of them are having issues with heavy metals and mercury poisoning because the reindeer mm -hmm. that they hurt are eating the fossil fuel exposure of for, for the mercury. So mm. the people that are most in tune with the planet are suffering the most with the people who care less about the planet, right? Because mm. the result of that mercury is getting into the reindeer and into the animals that they eat, and then they're dying from mercury contamination. Oh, it's very unfortunate. So that's affecting them now. Oh, that's nasty. Yeah, you have different herders up there from Nanettes and different Inuits, and they're getting exposure to high levels of mercury. And that's because oh. of our, our lifestyles, our first world lives. Oh well, wow. yeah. No, I, I hadn't heard that. So, how, how's the mercury getting into into the reindeer? Do you know? Well, fossil fuels are it's it's going out into the environment. We're releasing mm -hmm. tons and tons, like over hundred thousand metric tons a year, and so it turns into this absorbable mercury that gets into our water, and then it just right. just get there. So all getting of water collecting Nasty. mercury, yeah, especially in the oceans, it's really bad. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you have the higher food chain with mercury. But then you have the lower part of the food chain now with microplastics. So these animals are eating these things, and then these people are getting exposure to it. Because I did a research where people were saying, okay, well, they don't have long lives. And I'm like, okay, well, why? Or yeah. now, as of now, they're having shorter lifespans, but they're getting mercury exposure up there, which is very fascinating. Yeah. But also, but also again, that's average from birth, right? And if you have right. if you have a high infant mortality rate, you know, that's that's obviously gonna change. Like in you know, the eighteen hundreds, people say, Oh, well, people only lived to you know into their thirties. So, you know, you didn't gotcha. see these diseases. Yeah. And it's like, well, oh, no, again, that's average from birth, and that's the US statistics for you know Americans in eighteen fifty, average from birth was thirty-six. But these guys were not dumb. They certainly weren't as dumb as people are now. They actually looked at this and they did by every 10 years, by every decade, how long would you live? If you made it to if you started from zero, you know. Um, you know, what, uh, if you started from zero, how long would you live? On average, it would be 36 years. But if you made it to 10, how long would you live? Well, mm -hmm. that's on average, uh, you know, longer than that, you know, so like, you know, 56 years, and as you go up, it's more and more and more. And so when you get to actual like adulthood, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, you actually get up to, to similar ages that, uh, you know, that people would would live now. You know, and, you know, the, if you're looking at, at contemporary populations, um, it's, uh, you know, like the, the people in Hong Kong have the longest average life expectancy from birth and they eat the most meat per capita of anywhere else in the world. They eat like one and a half pounds of meat a day on average, right? So this is including children and women, not just, you know, uh, you know, you know, the, the adult males. And so, you know, that they're eating a lot of beef or, or a lot of meat anyway, and so, you know, it's, it's quite, um, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a different story when you say, well, the blue zone. So why wasn't that considered in the blue zone? Like that has like the highest life expectancy, you know, and yet, and yet we're not considering that in the blue zones, you know, because it doesn't, it doesn't fit that narrative. Um, and, uh, can you just hold on for, for two seconds, guys, we're just going to pause.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, I, I, um, Alvaro, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you know, you you came to Carnivore a while ago. Obviously, you had a lot of transition between, uh, you know, from from paleo and different sorts of things. But what actually made you turn to Carnivore? And you know, how long ago was that? What what sort of you know tipped uh, tipped that over for you? One of my good friends and mentor, uh, Rick, a good buddy of mine he kind of led me down that path. I was having different symptoms and issues. As I mentioned before, I had alopecia, I had gut issues, uh, a little bit of extra body fat, musculoskeletal pain, acne was a problem that I had. And he introduced this to me in about 2017, 18. And I was already pretty much there, close, very close, but I was still doing almonds and some a little bit of vegetable. I ate vegetable because I thought I had to. Mm. I literally like, steamed like two or three pieces of broccoli with my meat. So I was almost there, but I still had these interferences. And so I was getting bad acne. And so I was acne and gut issues. I had e-histolytica and I had a couple other bugs in my stomach that were just destroying me. And I was at the point that I'll like boil chicken and steam broccoli and still have gut issues. Mm. So my overall body was stressed out, probably eating. I was very intolerant to almonds. I did some blood testing later and figured out that I was super intolerant to almonds um, as well as gluten that I cut out early on. But after doing blood testing, I was seeing that I was intolerant to these things that I was consuming on that paleo diet that were praised as healthy foods. All of the junk food that they make when it comes to keto, paleo, and back then they didn't have keto treats because it wasn't as popular. But all that mm -hmm. stuff has like fake sugars, monk fruit, stevia, uh, almonds, and it was destroying my gut. I had no choice. My gut was destroyed. And most people hit that dead end and go to doctors and doctors just give you antibiotics. And so you go down that cycle. And so I, it was based off a of necessity. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a choice. My gut was thrashed and I was willing to try anything. And at that point, my friend introduced it and we were already there. We were already eating grass-fed meats and pasture-raised animals. And we were already hip to that because Paul Check introduced a, that type of diet. So it was like 20 years ago. He was already talking about this stuff. And out of necessity, that's what led me to go to the carnivore diet. I didn't have a choice. And now that I did it, I got all these awesome benefits. Like I got an eight pack. I got completely shredded. I thought I had to fast before. And he taught me that you don't have to fast when you're on a carnivore diet because you get the same benefits. And so I was able to have abs before because I was starving myself for 18 hours at a time and detoxing from the plants that I was eating. So mm -hmm. I was able to achieve the physique relatively close, but it wasn't quite there. Something was still off because I was getting these symptoms. So once I went fully carnivore, everything changed. It went from like a negative to like a bunch of positives. Skin got better. Energy levels got better. I'm older. Like you said, I feel better than in my 20s at 42. Athletic performance is, is, is great. As you said, we can do a lot of pull-ups all day long. Uh, energy is great in the gym. Recovery is great. I'm not as sore the next day. Flexibility is better. So out of necessity, I didn't have a choice. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish I would have found out about it when I was trying the paleo stuff in 2007, 6, 7. Um, but I'm glad I am doing it. And along with the lab testing to make sure that minerals are balanced. I do believe that some people might need some supplements, mm -hmm. but not randomly. You have to test, you have to make sure. And this is to make up for the plants that they eat before, because we know that if you are eating plant-based diets, you need more nutrients to, to process that stuff. So there might be their previous life, but I wholeheartedly agree with you. The majority of our nutrients should be coming from a species appropriate diet. And we will fill the needs and the gaps based off of um, our first world ways. I, I believe that we're animals learning how to become humans. So we're kind of reverse engineering what we're doing. So this is not real life, the matrix that we live in. So we're trying to go back to what our ancestors were doing because they didn't have these issues that we were dealing with. So out of necessity, I didn't have a choice, but I really do wish that I would have stumbled on it earlier. But now that I know this information, I'm very happy to share it with other high level athletes that want to perform well and people with autoimmune disorders and people that have hit a dead end wall. It's hard for me to convey this information to people that don't have full on blown symptoms yet. Mm -hmm. uh, most people are nursing symptoms in our society. You'll notice it, whether it's allergies or skin stuff, but they tolerate it because they just think that that's the way things are. But it's not. When you're eating the right diet, most of that stuff clears, clears out. So at a necessity, it turned into these amazing positive um, results that I didn't. I would have never imagined that acne would clear up. Like I, I dealt with adult acne. I didn't have it as a kid. I got it in my mm. 30s and it was bad and it was like painful. It yeah. hurt and it would come out and um, it went away. It went right away. And I'm, I'm researching it. I'm looking at dairy and reading about lactoferrin and candida and all these things and just going carnivore solved it. I tried all the other stuff. It didn't work. And carnivore 
worked immediately. And I'm eating mostly beef. I do do pork, but I only eat Iberical pork, so Spanish pork. Yeah. Don't eat much birds anymore. But yeah, mostly red meat, eggs. Um, and out of necessity, amazing things happen. Yeah, absolutely. And you did, uh, you know, you go by SF Ninja because you did like the American Ninja Warrior competitions. Is that right? Yeah, I competed on there for a while. Yeah. yeah. Was that was that when you were carnivore as well, or or before or after? I was I was I was more heavy paleo transitioning into carnivore. So while I was competing, I wasn't really eating much plants. I was just kind of taking pork chops and meat on onto the show with me and eating that. They actually interviewed nice. me about eating organ meats and stuff, and they were, they wanted to use that angle on me, like eating weird foods supposedly. But yeah. I was talking about liver in 2015 and talking about organ meats and the importance of these things yeah. because we learned about Weston Price early on. Nice. And that led us pretty far. But once we learned that information, we saw that there's much more before the fermentation and the sprouting of nuts. And there's a lot more before that. So it's very fascinating that that's what led us there. And to see the state that they were in at that time, having issues with flour and sugar, they weren't even eating high fructose corn syrup yet. They weren't eating aspartame. They weren't eating uh, yeah. glyphosate or seed oils yet. And they had issues with flour and sugar. Right. So wherever Dr. Price went, their teeth were rotting. And so that stuck with me early on. And then when we started looking deeper into their diets, we're like, okay, this can't be, they weren't sprouting nuts forever. This is like a new thing or the things that they're reading in the videos that he projected or said that they're reading weren't necessarily all their ancestral foods because they weren't able to eat bread and potatoes during certain times if you go back far enough. But that led me down the path to getting deeper into the ancestral diets. And then I spent a month in Africa. Uh, I went to the Masai Mara spent a month there oh, in Tanzania goodness. and Kenya. And I asked a lot of questions that I knew the answers to, but just to get that uh, qualified for me, which was really cool. And I got to see two different types of Masai. I got to see the colonized Masai that were fat. And then I got to see the people still living in the horse dung or the cow dung huts and they're, they're nomads. They move around yeah. um, and they, their worth is They base their worth off of how much livestock they have. So you can have as many wives as you like if you have enough livestock to support a, a family, right? So that's that's their beliefs, and that's how they've conducted for a long period of time. And they have a lot of the first world stuff. Like, they're, they're not exposed to any of this stuff. So they have a way more simpler life, the ones that are still living in their ancestral ways. And like you said, they're tall. They're like six foot three. They're lean. They're very healthy. They have these different rites to passage, and they respect the earth. And, and, I, and one guy picked up, like – the stick and started carving it and just started brushing his teeth with it. And I'm, you know, asking him what he's doing. He's just telling me he's brushing his teeth and I asked him, do you eat plants? And I know they don't eat plants, but he's like, no, but we use them as medicine. Yeah. And so that stuck with me because when people, it's not that plants are bad when you can't just say plants are bad, but they're not good for humans to eat, but they mm. can be used as medicine and we don't eat medicine. You only take medicine when you're sick. And so when he said that, I was like, Whoa, and he's like, we have all of our medicine here as we're just hiking through. Mm. you know where, where they are in the Masai Mara so that, that was a fascinating thing is that you don't eat medicine you you take it when you're ill and you would eat your food so it's completely different when when they introduce that concept to me they're very in tune with nature and they're eating mostly just goat uh their beef the blood because they can sew up the blood after so the cow can keep producing and and the milk and sometimes they'll mi mix the milk with the blood and we got to try that and they have different rituals and it's it's very fascinating. They don't have all the frivolous stuff that we have to deal with. We have all these really odd first world stressors that are very insignificant when you when you look at things in perspective. Yeah, definitely. And um, well, that's an awesome experience. I would love to do that and go and live with those guys and and uh, and see and just just see what it's like. And I think that you know, like you know, being in Bangladesh and you see like real problems, real actual you know life threatening problems all the time. And when you're out in the in the in the savannah and you've got to, you've got to contend with lions on a daily basis, you know, you know, the different sorts of things that we, we consider, oh, this is outrageous. All these people screaming about on, on the news every night, just, does, just it's not going to make the radar. I mean, like, you know, there are lions out there, you know, why are They're you hurting about, you know, what's that? They're hurting their cattle through yeah. big game. You have yeah. the big five there. You have rhinos, you have giraffes, you have lions, leopards, mm -hmm. and they're hurting cattle through that. Yeah. So 
this whole idea of people like, oh, well, they're lean because they get exercise. Nonsense. That they're not lean because they get exercise. They do get exercise, but that's not why they're lean. Yeah. They're eating the species appropriate diet, but they say that they don't get heart attacks because they're doing exercise. I'm like, wait, so meat causes heart attacks and will cause colon cancer, but because they do exercise, they're not going to get that now. That, that yeah. doesn't make any sense. But that's the rationale that people have when you introduce this information. Yeah. Um, and and, and tons that's of thing too. There, well, there was a study in the 1980s actually that looked at that because that was that was at the, at the height of this this whole like all fat is bad for them. And they were like, well, the Maasai eat a lot of saturated fat, they eat a lot of fat and a lot of meat, but they're not fat. You no, know, fat makes you fat. So what's going on here? They, well, they must just work out all the time. And they were like these guys are like Olympic athlete sort of level physiques, and and that as, as described in this study. And so they went like, oh, okay, well, they must be working out just a crazy amount. They must be working out like an elite you know, Olympic athlete or something like that. They found out, well, gosh, actually, no, it was only, they only uh, exercise more uh, like 1.6 times as much as the average American, right? Which was around the world was, was thought to be just the most sedentary, slothful couch potato, right? And so the Maasai were only 1.6 times that. Right. And so they're all, oh, well, it just must be genetic. You know, we'll just, uh, we don't know why, but yeah, you know, it's it off. Yeah, exactly. It's just, so instead of thinking about it and things like, well, maybe our, maybe our, 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 you know, uh, presumption that meat and fat are bad for us. Well, maybe that this is actually a point against that. And it is a, it's a major point against that, but they didn't consider that at the time because that, that was just what well, USDA said it. So obviously it has to be true. And so, yeah, but they, they don't, they don't exercise all that much, uh, more than, than other people. Uh, I would, I would probably say they don't work out as much as you guys do at all no. you know <laughs> and uh, you know they have and, more pragmatic um, lives they have a survival yeah. life so their, their workout is being out in the bush yeah just being out there and walking you know chasing and and running from things you know if they have to and uh but most of that's just just going around walking doing their thing they're very in tune with the planet and we're very disconnected from it right so there's actual footage you can google this of three maasai walking up to the lions and stealing their meat and walking away from it all three yeah. of them just walk you google it they walk up and take the meat from the lion and walk away and the lion was scared of them yeah. that's pretty great they take the yeah. meat and there's other ones i've seen where they're stealing meat from cheetah which is even more like vicious and, and snappy you just grab the meat from them and they hold yeah. their position and that's how in tune they are with the planet so yeah. that's a good way to see how strong and the capability of of what a human has inside of him and how we've been repressed from that because these three guys are making themselves big and they're taking the meat from the lions and the lions are like oh are they serious the yeah. run away well it, it says, you, know, you, you go in you walk in with confidence like that you know, and things yeah. are like, hey, what's going on, you know, and uh, yeah, so I saw the one with the cheetahs. I haven't seen the one with the lions, but I saw the one with the cheetahs. Vicious. There's, there's one guy. She was vicious. Che yeah, cheetahs are like freaking out. And one guy just has like a switch. It wasn't even like a big like club. Yeah. Just, like, like, him in the face. just like, hey, just get in there. <laughs> You know, and they're like yeah. snapping and one guy's pulling away and they're freaking out and he just keeps like, just whipping him in the face. And so one guy's whipping him in the face and, and keeping him back with the other one just drags it off. And then just, they just walk away. They're so casual about it. So casual. It's normal. Yeah. It's yeah, normal. It's they have this confidence. We know damn well that if you were to break your, your confidence, that thing will swipe at you once and or bite you in the neck and you're done. You become its mm -hmm. food. Yeah. Probably looked at the cheetah. Like, I'm gonna fucking smash you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they, walked in, they, they walked in there with a lot of confidence. These these ancestral people had. They're very in tune with the planet. They're very in tune, and they they know. I don't. I you know it's disheartening to hear Dr. Price call them primitives because I think it's the other way around. He had, he was the one that was primitive, going to learn from them. Mm. Uh, Bill Jamar Stephenson. That's another one who who had a, a lot of good information that got kind of brushed under the under the rug because of the Dr. Kellogg stuff, the Seventh-day Adventists going on at the same time. He had yeah. a lot of good information. He went up there and became healthier. He got stuck up there and got healthier. So this Arctic explorer got stuck up there and he was supposed to get food sent to him, did it, and had to live with, with the Inuits up there. They called them Eskimos at the time, but they were Inuits, indigenous. And he ate their food and came back healthier. And he was so stoked by that that he did the largest random control uh, trial study got a whole hospital and fed them all carnivore diet and got them all healthy. But because it was sponsored, I believe, by a meat industry, it got kind of swept under the rug the same time that Dr. Kellogg and the Seventh-day Adventists were pushing for cereals for breakfast as an anti-aphrodisiac. So there's a lot of information that, that pops out now that we're, we're getting about, access to. About those, the, the ones in Africa, the Maasai people over there, you said like exercise, but how much time do they actually stay just sitting around not doing anything? I think they like all have 
it depends on what they're doing, but they have to create shelter because they're nomads. So they're always moving around to graze the, the cattle. So it depends on what your role is. But I think, I mean, just from studying how these people, they were very sophisticated at hunting, not the Maasai because they weren't really hunting as much as the Hadza or other indigenous people, but they were farmers, but they, they become very practical at their lives. If all you have to worry about is shelter, food, and, and, and you know, keeping the family intact, they have pragmatic lives. So it, it becomes just, it's natural for them. Like when I, there's videos of the Inuits hunting and they create fences in like lakes and they corral all these fish and they're getting hundreds of pounds of fish in the middle of the winter. So when people say, oh, it's not realistic to hunt and gather every day, nonsense. These people were highly evolved and, and intelligent with and, and sophisticated with their forms of hunting. This guy's like catching hundreds of pounds of fish in the middle of dead winter. Whereas one of us goes up there, we'd all starve to death because we wouldn't know what to do. So I believe if your job was to get shelter and to hunt and to and to eat, then you would have a lot of time to sit around and talk about philosophy after because they have their things intact. So mm. they have less frivolous things to worry about than we do, but they're very sophisticated when it comes to being in tune with nature. So, yeah, I guess like I, I, there is some kind of daily activity. Everybody's at least mm. doing something at least maybe moving, once or maybe a few times yeah. a day. Yeah, they're moving, getting water. Uh, Picking things up. Animals, you know, moving the cattle around. Because yeah. some of the strongest people I know are people that live on farms or that work farms or that are like, you know, some, yeah. some people from the Midwest or, you know, you just shake their hand and their hand is like, they never lifted a weight in, 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 their, in, their, in their life, but... Yeah, they, you know, pick hail bales was, up. Yeah, and, 50 bales of hay a day. Yeah, that's... Yeah, and, and they're strong, man. They're strong. And then sometimes, like, you know, we being in, like, you know, San Francisco, I, I'm sure there's people that don't pick up anything for days at a time. Well, that's why we have the obesity and the 90% of people you with know. autoimmune disorders, metabolic mm -hmm. dysfunction, overweight, right? We have over 80% of people now are overweight. It's probably higher now after the pandemic. Most health practitioners are overweight. Most doctors are obese. Nurses are obese. So like the whole matrix is of so it's almost overweight like people. Maybe like a part of an ideal human lifestyle is a certain amount of activity yeah. on a daily basis. I believe that's why we work out is to make up for not being hunters and gatherers because we would be on the field doing these primal movement patterns, squat, lunge, push, pull, bend, twist on, on field. We wouldn't have to go to the gyms. And I think that's why they're sports. Yeah, uh, well, the physical activity that they had sort of emulate that. Talking. Yeah, yeah, and also right uh, to emulate war. You know, and we right sort of we sort of right. yeah civilized war a bit as well. You know, where you have like you know these two team rivals just coming in and just battling each other. That's just a bit. You get that sort of that natural aggression out instead of you know actually having like a clan warfare and killing each other or you know and, you know actual you know professional fighting. I mean that's that is that is you know that down to you know one-on-one -on -one sort of situation um Primitive. you know that's that's sort of meeting that that need and desire and and uh, drive of people to have to compete and dominate and be you know uh you know physically dominant in in you know in among their peers and things like that as well and uh but yeah it's um you know we're sort of I think we're pretending at life more than anything now, you know, because we're doing all these things that emulated things that were just part of life that the Maasai deal with every single day. Um, and, you know, the idea that, you know, it's, it's not practical to be a hunter gatherer every day. It's kind of crazy to me because the thing is that we were hunters for 3 million years and uh, really only hunter gatherers for the last 20,000 years. And um, before that it was really just hunters, you know, and they would live like the Maasai or, or whomever. And they would, they knew which plants they could eat if they needed to, or to use medicinally, but really they just ate meat. They just hunted and eat meat. You know, what, what animal out there is living any other way? All animals in the wild, you know, if you're a predator, you're hunting, you're hunting or you're dying. That's it. And, uh, you know, and the herbivores, they're, they're foraging and they're finding their food and they're moving, they're going, they're just looking for food, looking for food. That's what all animals do. And we're part of that too. Oh, it's unrealistic. No, that's, that's, that's the way of the world. That's how it actually used to work. And people would say, well, you can't have civilization without, uh, without agriculture. I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I, that's a, that's an argument. That's a long, that's an argument that's long been made. I don't buy it because, you know, the native Americans are about a hundred million native Americans, just, just like in America, like North, like, you know, North of Mexico, sort of America and, um, and in Canada as well. And they, they had like cities, like in St. Louis, what's now St. Louis, there's an area 
that had like permanent structures and buildings that that were estimated could have fit one million people, one million full time residents, right? Wow. In like 14, 1500s, we found this, right? Or really, the 1600s, we found it because, you know, after there was like some sort of plague that was wiped through, it wiped out like 95% of Native Americans. You know, I don't, I don't think it was intentional, like the smallpox blankets or anything like that, but something happened and hit them. And this, like, you know, the pilgrims coming over to Plymouth Rock, they came and there was like no one there. There's just supposed to be people there and there really wasn't anyone. And then after that, sort of period in the 1600s, people started moving west. They couldn't go west for 200 years before that because there wasn't any west to go. It was just, it was so densely populated that they were like, they're on their little patch and that's where they stayed. And um, and you couldn't go west because there were just a buttload of people there. There wasn't any room to go. But now all of a sudden people were gone. They're like, okay, well, let's, let's explore. Let's see what's happening. And they started going out and going out. Couldn't find anyone, couldn't find anyone. They're like, what the hell is going on? And they came across these ghost towns. And one was in, in St. Louis and it was like, and, but the, they had these trade routes, like these five major trade routes going up to the great lakes, going out east, west, south, and all these sorts of different directions that were, had been so well used for hundreds and hundreds of years that they were still there, you know, decades after no one had used them. And then they found these, these cities that were, you know, would have, would have housed a million people at, you know, at, at any given time. And so they they just ate meat. You know, these weren't farmers. This was, it wasn't an agrarian society. This was a hunter society. You know, they had buffalo drops where they would they would chase a, a part of the herd out, and uh, buffalo would fall over a cliff. They'd die. That was their food for the year. They had one big dangerous event a year, and that was it. You know, and they you know hunt and do other sorts of things throughout you know throughout the rest of the year. But that was the main supply of their food you know, for the Plains, Plains Indians. And so that was, a, that was a huge society that was, that was completely, uh, survive on, on, on the migration routes of animals. They weren't even, it wasn't even livestock. You know, this was just, this was just hunting. And then, you know, the, the Mongol empire, was the largest empire, largest contiguous empire has ever existed. And they were carnivores. You know, they lived like the Maasai do now they drank horse blood, ate horse meat and fermented mare's milk. And, mm these guys were huge, these big, strong bastards that just absolutely swept through all the, you know, two continents, two major continents and, uh, and, and, and carved out this massive empire that lasted for hundreds of years until there's some sort of catastrophe and massive die off of the plants and the vegetation and the cow and, and cow, people that were herding cows were just more adapted than, than people with horses. Horses don't get as much nutrition and protein out of, out of uh, grass as cows do. Cows get most of the nutrition out of out of grass. And so the people that were better at or had had more cows and things like that, they were the ones who sort of, you know, took over. And I think that, that's really what Russia is now, you know, that those old remnants of the old Mongol empire. And so, you know, that's, um, that's a massive empire that just, they just ate meat, you know, and, and they had cities, they ran cities and they, this is what they, they did. Now, maybe they're taking over other cities. You know, you could argue that, but uh, either way, they had an empire running on meat for hundreds of years, and it was massive. So I, you know, I don't, I just don't, I don't believe those, those statements. You know that you have to have agriculture to have society to have civilization, and and you hunter gatherer life is just not really feasible. It's just a pipe dream. We've been doing it for millions of years, and even in the last few hundred years, we have seen examples of massive civilizations exclusively eating meat. And in fact, those lands were much more fertile as a result of it. You know, the, the grass was so tall in the middle of America at that time with hundreds of millions of buffalo and, you know, billions of other large game animals throughout the plains that the grass was so long that it was tall that it was, uh, there was reports that they, the explorers could tie the grass in knots over their horses' heads while on horseback, Right. Wow. Massive. It's like you know, it's tall grass in India or something like that, where you're expecting like tigers and things like that to come running out. But that was it. You know, the animals, those ruminant animals, they actually made the ground more fertile. They made the uh, the plant life more abundant because they made the, the the soil more rich. And when you take those things away, the more animals you take away, the less fertile the land gets, the more depleted the soil gets, and the less plant life there is. And so, you know, in fact, it's not feasible to not do that. And we have 
I think, you know, a, a, a clock ticking at the moment that if we don't start getting back to massively animal based society, that we're, we're going to run into serious, serious problems very soon. Isn't that when they had like the, isn't that what the dust bowl was or like yeah. where they had all these farming lands and then all the soil got so dry and killed off all the micro that all of a sudden now you had a bunch of dead soil that you couldn't grow mm -hmm. anything on and led to a bunch of, is, isn't that what the yeah. dust bowl was? Isn't yeah, you know, that, that's exactly right. And it was turning into a desert and it was turning into like a Sahara desert in the middle of America. Whereas before this was so, this was, it was so like just verdant, you know, had all this, this plant life and grass. Uh, there was just this massive, massive, massive uh, stalks of grass. And yeah, so they, um, that was, that was due to farming techniques. They were just, just, you know, the way they were farming, there's just this, just straight row, you know, miles long, the wind would pick up and it just blow it all, all away. They blow away all the loose topsoil that you've just churned up in your plow, um, or the rains and it washes that off, it washes the seeds off, washes all the topsoil off. And, uh, and so it just kept doing that and they just, you know, and there was a lot of topsoil, there's a lot of topsoil, but eventually they just, they just wore it out. And, um, and so then they, you know, when, when that's massively picking up in the middle of America, we have these massive, massive farms and doing it in this fashion that was sort of getting worse. And so they figured it out. They figured out this was from our farming techniques. And so they were able to, now you see a lot of scallop patterns, like a big, big curves and circles and things like that. Uh, that's one of the reasons, uh, one, of, one of the ways they prevented this was, so it's not just a straight row that goes for miles and miles and miles. It's sort of curved and turned. So wind can go and pick it up or the rain can sort of wash, but it's only going to go so far. You're not going to wash a lot of it away, but even, even still, with our current farming techniques, we're still losing 27.5 billion tons of topsoil a year. And topsoil is made about half an inch every 500 years. So it's, it's, it is a scarce commodity. So, so that is, is the equivalent of about a, an area the size of Kentucky every year, right? Of topsoil. And so like that, that's a, that's a vast, a vastly, um, diminishing vanishing resource you know that's that's going away quickly and we will run out and i think that that's what the major deserts of the world like in the middle east and in africa like the sahara desert that's a man-made desert and in egypt those the, the pyramids and the sphinx i remember in the 90s they did soil samples under under those structures and they were like oh we have this oh it's always been uh, you know, desert people and desert pyramids and things like that. And they're, they're shocked. They say, well, well, actually, you know, the soil is, is more what we would expect in like jungles. So these were like, these were probably built in jungles so like jungle pyramids, jungle sphinxes and things like that. So these were jungle people, but then, you know, Egypt was the breadbasket of the ancient world. This is where they grew a lot of grain. They had the Nile river and it flooded every year. And so it replenished the, the nutrients into the soil. Uh, every year. Well, what does that mean? That means that you had to replenish the nutrients because the nutrients were going away. You were stripping them out and putting them in the plants, and then you were taking those plants away. They weren't going back into the soil. But what happens when you start farming when you don't have a Nile River that that floods every year? Then then the nutrients don't get back in in the soil, and you have the same problems that we had in the middle of America, and things turn turn to dust. They had locust swarms. They had dust storms. And, uh, and that was, I mean, that's like straight out of Exodus, you know, like the plagues, you know, sent on Pharaoh, um, you know, were the same things that we were seeing in the Dust Bowl era. And that's what, you know, people thought at the time, this was, this was the wrath of God. He's angry with us. We're being so sinful. And, um, so I think that's what happened back then as well. Um, you know, you look at, there's a satellite images that using infrared technology, looking down at the Sahara desert, they actually see like cities and, and human settlements and, and structures, in what is now the Sahara Desert, so this is, this has, you know, washed over, uh, you know, a lot of human settlements, uh, you know, over thousands of years, and I think that's largely to do with with farming. You know, you look at, uh, you know, uh, the Middle East, and you know, this is this is this is the the birth of uh, of agriculture. That's where it's thought to be like the first instance of large spread farming was in like Samaria. And, uh, you know, Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq, right? And, you know, back then you read Gilgamesh, which is like the oldest written story, you know, that, that's the oldest thing that we found written down. Um, and uh, that, if you read that, it talks about those plains uh, being like a savanna, 
you know, like just these big grassy fields with deer and antelope and buffalo and all these sorts of things and, and cedar forests that have never, you know, seen an ax and like Gilgamesh has to go and his, um, uh, his, his buddy Enki do, they go and they fight the spirit of the, of the forest so that they can cut down these cedar trees and make a big temple and things like that. And, uh, and then like, you know, the spirit like tells him, warns them that this is actually going to be destructive and, and horrible. And this is actually going to destroy the world. So I'm like, that was like sort of a bit, um, you know, ominous and, and for, you know, had a lot of foreshadowing to what we're seeing today with the destruction of the world. But, you know, they're describing, you know, very verdant plant filled savannas and forests and things like that in what is modern day Iraq. Right. And so, you know, and so that I think that that's a direct result of of the farming techniques that have just sort of destroyed the land and turned these things into into uh, barren landscapes. People blame that on herding, but you know, I mean, yes, and you can you can overgraze and and destroy the land. You can certainly do that, but if you're if you're a migratory nomadic herder, you're moving through. You're moving through. You're not you're not destroying the land. You're making it better, just like migratory animals. And you know, this thought that you know, oh, it's, it's the animals that overgraze and that was destroys the land. You know, they put this in practice in Zimbabwe and they they killed uh, 30,000 elephants because they were saying, well, the elephants are causing deserts and they killed 30,000 elephants and the deserts got worse. I was like, well, what does that tell you, buddy? And in fact, the guy who uh, did that was a guy named Alan Savory and he was devastated because he actually loves elephants, but he proved that you know elephants were causing these deserts and of course then they killed 30,000 elephants and the deserts got worse right so he didn't actually prove anything he just you know proved it to himself and, and to others thought that he proved it and uh, but actually it was the opposite and so that's why you know Richard Feynman said it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are if it doesn't agree with experiment it's wrong. And so they did the experiment. They killed 30,000 elephants and did the exact opposite. So it's wrong. And so he realized that he was wrong and he started looking into this and he realized, no, actually it's these migrating animals that make the land better. And so he's taking, you know, large herds of animals bunched and moving like a, a migratory group of animals and they're regrowing deserts. They're, they're reversing desertification. And uh, I think it was in Patagonia, they took like 25,000 sheep and moved them through like the deserts in, in Patagonia and the vegetation increased by 50% in one year. Right. Wow. So it was, it was a big, big change and they're and they're making, and this is where like the sort of the regenerative farming uh, mindset is coming from. A lot of it's coming from the work of Alan Savory. He's been doing this for 40 years and showing. And so people come to him and say, Hey, how do I do this on my land? So his land, Zimbabwe, it's just like, it's just jungles. It's in like the middle of the desert. You know, but his patch is brilliant. It's and elephants are moving in, animals are moving in, you know, because it's it's you know it's such a, a an abundant source of life, and so and that's making it even better, and it's stabilizing the waterways, and they have water year round because it doesn't just like flow away elsewhere; it flows off and just dissipates because the banks aren't secure. You know, the the water it doesn't draw water into the soil; it doesn't draw water in. Uh, it just it just dissipates and then evaporates off. But where he's at, he's got running water year round, you know. And so, you know, this is this is, yeah. And this has been done again and again and again, you know. Uh, um, you know, and so when you have these experiments, you have something in the published data, it has to be reproducible. It's like, okay, I'm going to follow these steps just like a you know recipe in a cookbook, and I should be able to get the same results, right? And so, if you can't, if it's not reproducible, it's wrong, right? His is reproducible again and again and again, all over the world. For the last 40 years when it's him doing it or someone else doing it and so you know this is just indicative of the fact that you know we've been sold this false bill of goods that you know growing monocrop is the, oh well, that's that's life that's plants that's that's nature no you know one crop is not nature you, know, you have to destroy the environment you have to destroy nature to grow that one crop you have to kill all the plants and all the animals you have to destroy an entire ecosystem just to grow that one crop and you're stripping nutrients out of the soil you're losing topsoil you're losing nutrients you're making things worse and then you're not replacing it you're not making it better and they say oh well we we'll just put in a bunch of you know petroleum-based uh fertilizers and things like that well those aren't very good and you know they're dumping mercury and crap into the system. They have a lot of runoff again because you're putting in all these fertilizer and things. The rains 
uh, washes that away, gets into the, into the water supplies, killing off, you know, tons and tons and tons of, of, uh, you know, um, you know, river and water life and sea life and things like that as well. So this is actually like an ecological disaster, what we're doing. And we really need to go back to that simple structure of just doing what is our biologically appropriate thing to do, which is just eating meat. It's better for us. Is better for uh, the environment. It's better for animals overall. It's better for the world overall. And uh, I, I don't really see another way of doing this that's going to be successful. You have people in third world countries paid beneath the poverty level picking these things and then flying mm. it here and calling it ethical. They may right. be covered in glyphosate, right? So they're getting covered in pesticides. Uh, they're paid beneath the poverty level. So they're not paid much. And then it's flown here. How realistic is a food yeah. system where everything has to be flown on an airplane? Because we're so disconnected from the food system because we go to the grocery store. But I'm in San Francisco. There's no pineapple trees here. There's no kiwis here. But we can get it any time of the year. So it's a disconnected food system that's not realistic. And it's on the backs of other people. Yeah. But when we're eating grass-fed beef, it comes from this country. Like We're yeah. not exploiting people from other countries. So how ethical is it to get someone paid beneath the poverty level to pick our fruits and vegetables that are covered in pesticides? Yeah. And then flying it. Well, yeah, I mean, and there's there's some of the stuff that's really nasty. nasty. I mean, and, and you know, not even getting into the whole um, you know rare earths to do all the the batteries and things like that. I mean, those are just terrible strip mines. They're horribly dangerous. Oh, oh. People are just dying. Yeah, it's just disgusting. People can look that up, but it's horrible. I mean, it's just completely inhumane working conditions. Chaos. Or, dying and and getting extremely hurt and exposed to heavy metals and things like that but even just the food thing like in india uh, this is where like all our cashews come from and oh cashews are so good cashew milk and cashew this and cashew that look cashews are great like i i enjoy the taste of cashews even though i don't eat them uh anymore but i, I remember that they tasted good but they this is such a big industry now that they people are having their kids work to you know break because it's, it's quite an involved process breaking down these cashews you know heating them up breaking them down it's like it comes with a big hard shell and they have to get this little tiny nut out of there um and uh and it's it's laborious work it can really damage your hands people get like you know burn their hands damage their hands get caught in you know machinery and things like that and so but they're having their kids do this so instead of their kids going to school uh they make too much money making cashews and so they have to they have to have them out of school and then they're just making cash so they can make money uh for the for the family and so you know and uh you know it's um and we're we're benefiting off that and thinking oh this is so good it's this is just oh it's just one with nature this is just eating plants like but where did those plants come from you know who had to suffer as a result of it you know these people you know went there and and permanently crippled their hands uh, to give you that stuff so that they could still live below the poverty poverty line. And they didn't go to school as a result of that, which means that they're never going to get out of out of the poverty that they're in. Now, you know, it's hard to say exactly, you know, would they have been able to go to school anyway, you know, if they were that impoverished that, you know, making a few extra cents a day is going to help the family so much that, you know, it's better for them to come do that than go to school. Maybe they were in a position they wouldn't have been able to go to school anyway. They would have to do some other job. It's hard to say. But it, but the fact remains is that these are kids. This is child labor doing this, and uh, and it's and it's destructive to their health. You know, they get damaged. They're 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 they can permanently cripple their hands and hurt themselves um, for making cashews. You know, and that's you know that's not a good thing. Like any way you look at it. Well, listen, listen, you guys talk a little bit. Just yeah, makes you think: Are humans a positive or a negative? on the world mm. right really at the end of the day modern or ancestral you know no. and you know uh like since we've been doing the the since you know i've been learning more about the carnivore and stuff like that i definitely you know one way that i try to help is try to you know keep it locally raised try to buy from sustainable farms that are you know trying to go pasture raise and something within driving distance trying to stay away from fruits that are being flown in or mm. brought in from somewhere that's not within our region. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's almost like the more humans that are on the planet, is that, is that really a positive or a negative in the, in the big scheme of things, you know? Yeah. Because well, I think, it, I think, it's all for demand. It's big business, yeah. it's big business. Yeah. And it's because yeah. of demand. You know? It's yeah. because, you know, people are choosing to put themselves first. 
Mm -hmm. right? People put themselves first. Well, they're going to put themselves over someone else. And that someone else is the little kid in India over there, you know, picking the, picking the cashew trees because this guy over here thinks he's worthy of having, you know, some kid pick his, you know, cashew nuts or whatever the case may be. These people believe that it's an ethical diet. They're saying that plant-based is better for the environment. So how is that better for the environment when they're flying it here? Right. So they need all these fossil fuels and airplanes require a lot of that. And then you're having people that are extremely poor picking it. And then they're they're using it as some form of virtue signaling. And it's it's far from it because it's actually yielding the opposite effect. Yeah, um, for sure. Because they that, believe that what they're doing is that you could also do, you could uh, you could also do that with animals, right? Like you got these chickens being raised in no, of on course. top of each other, mm-hmm. right? Want the chicken can't even open its wings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's unfortunate. I don't want to eat that chicken. Yeah, uh, you know, that's not the chicken I want to eat. I want to eat a chicken that's running, you know, running around and or cows. Like, how many cows are in a little kennel yeah. or, or little, you know, he 10 by 10 or whatever? And they can't yeah. even. So it goes not just, but I think it's that makes me think about, man, how many different ways, you mm-hmm. know. Um, you know, could we do things the right way? But yeah, like when I definitely have talked to Alvaro about like, you know, because that's why I was asking, what is the main reason like the people that are vegan that that tell you the reason they're being vegan? Because from what I hear for the most part, like it's like, oh, you know, that's mean to animals. I'm like, well, mean to animals, wait a second, mean to animals. <laughs> I mean, like you're saying, the agricultural farming is killing off how many microorganisms, how many bees and microorganisms and like life in the soil, all these things that are part of a bigger human cycle or life cycle, shall we say, bigger life cycle. How many of these things are being killed off because you don't want to eat a cow? Mm-hmm. Instead, you want to eat, you know, yeah. some spinach or whatever. And then you start having the amounts of land that you got to kind of in order to make, you know, because again, and, and the way I see it, it's big business. So then, you know, obviously it's easier to maintain a, I don't know how many acres of just spinach, things that don't move, that are sitting there and that are getting sprayed with pesticides to allow them to grow as opposed to maintaining a cow, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a cow, one cow can feed how many people? Hundreds and hundreds of pounds. As long as it's, you know, being raised properly and it has its space, it's living a good life. I don't feel guilty about eating meat because a lion eats meat every day. Yeah, you know, it's they it's kind of them apart again, alive. You know, the fish and so on and so forth. I mean, there are people, you know, there. Are, yeah, I mean, so I don't feel guilty for eating animals. And it's funny, yeah. Like if the reason for being vegan is because of guilt of harm to animals, that is a little bit almost like uh, sounds a little hypocritical in a lot of ways. It, it, it is, because, unfortunately. I mean, it might be insects that are getting killed off and they might not be, oh, yeah. insect, is there, but it's still, it's still an animal, it's still a living creature. When they do, when they, when they qualify or quantify that, it's it's very vast. What was it, like 87,000 things die? Like there was these studies mm-hmm. that were floating around. Everything gets decimated. Everything, mm-hmm. like from the worms, bugs, bees, bees are getting destroyed by almond mm-hmm. milk, like almond um, Almonds in general decimating bee population. They have commercial bees, and every time they send them in, a large percentage of them die because they pollinate the almonds. But almond milk is like in demand all over the world, and most of it comes from here. So a lot of cattle can graze on land that we can't farm on. So it actually gives back, but we're, we're just mm-hmm. focused in the wrong places. And then the insects can live, and then the soil can live, and, and then the, the, the cow gives the poop to the yeah. soil, the, the fertilizer mm-hmm. to the soil. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Sure. That's right, yeah. Of, uh, you could do searches of land in the United States that that's missing these certain minerals, like selenium. There's so mm-hmm. many parts of America, when you look at the, the these different... Uh, maps of just depleted soil where there's just no minerals left at all because we've over farmed it and yes. it's it's affecting the animals too because the animals are going to have less of those minerals and nutrients and then it's a chain chain reaction and a lot of mm-hmm. that is because of the, the poor farming practices yeah i mean even even like the the vegetation that we have like i, I saw something is like the the spinach of the 1950s or you know broccoli whatever produce had like you know, three times as many nutrients as, as they do now, you know, it's just the soil being depleted. 
and you know you do have this massive environmental destruction it's not just it's not just the bugs that are getting killed i mean those are being killed by in the trillions you know um but it uh, there was something that was like in america it was like eight point was it or 6.7 billion animals die every year from from agricultural practices and there was um and that those are generally like you know rodents and birds and and snakes and things like that they get tilled up and crushed and and destroyed when you're you're tilling these lands and uh, and you have to kill off the deer and the pigs and the kangaroo and all the different sorts of things that are coming in to eat your crop and uh, you know they have like snipers that are taking out these these big animals that are trying to to eat their crops and so you know there was a study out of university of new south wales here in australia in 2011 that showed that um to get one pound of plant-based protein you have to kill 25 times as many sentient animals so not not insects but sentient animals than you would uh, for getting one pound of of uh, uh, animal-based protein and if you consider the bioavailability of animal-based protein is 100% and that of plants is much less than 100% depending on where you get it from. Um, that And it comes with a lot of other things with it. Just that if you're getting a pound of bioavailable protein, I think it's going to be a lot more animals that you're going to have to kill. You know, I mean, think that you have to destroy an entire ecosystem. So even if you're not killing more and more animals, you've already destroyed an entire habitat. So 55% of Borneo's rainforests have been destroyed for palm seed oil crops. And, and the vegans would argue, well, but that's okay because it was replaced with trees. So, you know, same, same. You know, I said, yeah, yeah, you, you bulldoze all these trees, you killed all the orangutans, you killed all the snakes, you killed all the birds, you killed all the monkeys, you killed all the animals that lived there, but you replaced it with trees. So same thing, you know, no, it's not the same thing. All of those, all those animals are dead now. Um, and, uh, and that's not a habitat, you know, you know, yeah, it's, what, not, it's not eco, eco diverse, right? Yeah, that's there's it. no eco diversity. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And if those animals are coming in, yeah, there'll be birds and whatever. But if like monkeys come in or this come in and they mess with that crop, those those animals get shot. You know, that's the reality, you know, because that is money and that that's people's that's that's people's livelihood. And they're going to protect that. And so they start messing with the crop. Those animals, those animals are going to go down. Um, you know, I think that I think that like the vegans, you know, have the right motivations. You know, they, they they're worried about. The environment, like you said, you know, are we a net positive or net net negative? You know, in a lot of ways, we're a net negative. Um, we're do, doing a lot of things that are damaging the world, and I think a lot of those motivations from vegans are that, like, hey, you know, we we can't do this. You know, we need to be, um, you know, we need to be responsible stewards of the world, and and we're not doing that. And so they're looking for ways to do that, and they and they've just been fed this this line of garbage that you know, going plant-based is going to do that. It's going to help that. It's completely wrong, but that's, you know, a big motivation for them. I know one guy who went vegan purely because of that. He's like, I like meat. I think it's the most nutritious. I agree with all of that, but I can't, I can't just co ethically consciously do that uh, because I think it's destroying the environment. And so, you know, that's, that's where a lot of people are coming from as well. So I think the motivations are like right. giving people uh, how to be a carnivore the right way. Yeah. Or the most sustainable rate, right? Yeah. Don't go to McDonald's. <laughs> don't yeah. don't go buy meat from McDonald's. Yeah. Because we know they ain't growing the cows the right way. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, well, like find a butcher. Yeah. Go find the local butcher. Make friends with the local farm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so, so people can be conscious about this and, you know, and people can, can vote with their pocketbook, you know, and more and more people are going to the rancher and going to the regenerative farms and because that's, and they're willing to pay more to do that. People are going to start paying attention to that. And I think more and more ranchers are starting to, to notice that because they're getting gouged right now, you know, by the, by the different, you know, meat processing companies, you have to sell, you, you, you raise these cows, you sell it for nothing. And then they, and, and, but the prices of meat are going up and up and up, but ranchers are getting less and less and less. Right. What the hell is that about? Right. And so, you know, they, if they can go directly to you, the consumer, that's going to be better for them and you. And so you go, you know, you, but you know, it, it can be a larger upfront cost. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone has, you know, two you know, chest freezers that they can stick a whole cow in, you know? And so, you know, it's not everyone can do this, but if you can, it ends up being much cheaper 
in the long run and better for the ranchers and more nutritious as well because you're getting better quality food. And so this is what I try to do in, in America. I, I, you, you can't do it here in Australia, unfortunately, but I would go to ranchers and I would buy direct from the ranchers and the ones that only did grass fed, grass finished. And I would get older cows. I'll get the cows that were 10 years old. They were amazing. They tasted amazing. And, uh, and it was cheaper. It was cheaper than even buying, uh, you know, a young steer, because normally there's no market for older cow, which is stupid, by the way, this is this, this way better meat. And, um, but people want younger meat because it's more tender. Well, it's also less flavorful and it's less nutritious, but that's the market at the moment as it is. And uh, I think mostly because people just don't know, they've never had the option. So they've just never been able to make the choice. Me making the choice, it's clear, get the older cow. And so because they, they weren't able to like sell it for like normal steaks, they would have to just grind it up into hamburger and sell the hamburger. They would get much, much less. And so this guy was able to give me a, a deal on it. I think I got it for like two bucks a pound for like an entire wow. cow. And that was with butcher fees. They hung it for 21 days, butchered it up into steaks and hamburger. And uh, and I, I just went and went to the farm and picked it up. Two bucks a pound. You know, it was great. And when you buy like that, do they, so do you get like every cut of the cow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're going to like, are there pieces of meats or steaks that you wouldn't maybe consider the most flavorful or the most ideal, but you just get it because it's part of the package? Yeah. So yeah, you're not just getting steaks, right? You're getting a lot of steaks. But, you know, you're, you're also getting, you know, the chuck and the brisket and the, uh, you know, the different different uh, like stew meats and things like that that would be more tough. But actually, those tougher cuts are are really flavorful, but you just have to slow cook them. You know, you have to cook them a bit a bit differently. And so you do like in a roast or even doing like a sous vide. I, I would only use a sous vide with um, silicon bags, though, because I, I wouldn't cook it in the plastics. Um, but if you if you do that, you slow cook it in whatever way you do it, and you smoke it, whatever. Um, it can, uh, it, it's just, it's really, really good. It has really good flavor and really good fat content. And, uh, and then, yeah, you get a lot of hamburger, you get a lot of hamburger, a lot of the, the cow turns into hamburger as well, but then you're getting, you're getting ribs, you're getting, you know, whatever steaks you want, you know, if you want T-bones or if you want, um, New York's and filet mignon, you get all, all those sorts of things, uh, any way you want it. So you can, you can ask, you can tell them how you want it butchered up. You know, and so and you can tell them and, and you should tell them, keep all the fat on there. Don't trim any fat off because like you want the fat. We want the fat, but they're just naturally just going to leave just a little thin strip because aesthetically, that's what we we were used to instead of leaving like the big chunk of fat. So I, I didn't tell them on this time, uh, this last time I did, but that was like four years ago before I moved to Australia. But anytime I'll get anything butchered from here on out, I'm telling them don't trim off any. If you trim off any fat, I want it. I want it in a bag. And give it to me and uh you know, and uh just give, give me it. that whole cow bro every piece yeah yeah <laughs> do not sting on the fat and um but they but they just normally would do it you know because they they, they think that's oh we just people don't want the fat they'll they'll throw the fat away they just want the lean meat no i want the fat you know it's i want glasses. they trim up those ribeyes and cut the lip off it's like dude what, are you doing? what is like that it's like a naked it's like a plucked chicken it's just like no feathers it's yeah. like it has no it was terrible to eat those ribeyes and that's what yeah. you find the most because people think Crazy. that they're getting ripped off when they have the fat taken or uh when the fat's still on the ribeye they want to lean yeah. ribeyes <laughs> i mean that's just an oxymoron i mean ribeye aren't lean but yeah i i talked to uh someone here who who distributed like meat wholesale and someone bought like a whole ribeye loin right and uh and then they went back they came back and with like a bag of like with like five pounds of fat. And they were like, this had five pounds of fat on it. I want five pounds of meat. You saw a rip off, whatever. It's just like you bought ribeye. What do you, what were you That's expecting? Smart. Like if you didn't want fat, why the hell did you go for the fattiest cut? You know, like what an idiot, you know? And, um, and I don't know why, but they were just like, you know, they, uh, the, and this person uh, was saying, I was like, oh, I gave it to him. I gave him, you know, five pounds of like meat just because it was just such a headache. I didn't want to like deal with it. But I was like, that's, that's ridiculous that people are doing that. And, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I, I got some ribeyes here and it was like on the bones so with like the big tomahawks, but like I got it in bulk from Costco. And, um, because normally it had like the best fat content and I didn't care about the bone or anything. I just, I wanted like the high fat content. And so I bought a, a big box of them 
Right. So it's, it was like, it was like $800 for this whole thing for like you know, 30 of these or no, sorry, 18 of these things, big bastards. And I got it home, opened up the box and like they, they trimmed it off. They trimmed off the cap and the tail, it was just like that middle sirloin part. It was like a meat popsicle. It was just like, what the hell is this? And, uh, you know, I was like talking to him, I was just like, Hey, this is, this is bullshit. Like, you know, this is, this isn't a damn ribeye. And then the guy was like trying to give me a stick because it's like, you know, it's Australia and they don't, you know, I mean, I know Costco's return policy. It's like 100%, no questions asked. Like you're not satisfied with it. It goes back, you know? And like, like I'm well aware of that. And this guy was American too. And he's trying to bullshit me and, uh, and say like, well, but there's nothing wrong with the meat. There's nothing wrong with me. I mean, the meat itself is fine. And I was just like, yeah, there's nothing, you know, there's, there's, so there's nothing wrong with the meat. So you can't return it. And I was like, look, there's nothing wrong with hamburger either, but that's not what I paid for. You know, I didn't, I'm not paying, you know, $35 a pound for, for, for sirloin. You know, I bought a ribeye. I wanted the fat. I'm like, you take the cap off of a ribeye. It's not a damn ribeye. Like that's ridiculous. And so that is the best part. And so, you know, they, they just stripped this thing, uh, just absolutely ridiculous. And it ended up, you know, calling him out because like, he, he wouldn't let me take it back. But then like, I emailed him and I emailed like, like corporate. And I was just like, Hey, you know, I'm from Kirkland, Washington, where you guys are from. Like I've been going there since Costco opened. My family's been there since Costco opened. Like I'm damn, I'm, I'm absolutely well aware of your return policy. And I'm, I'm quite upset with this. Like this should have gone back instantly. He's just like, Oh yeah, come back right away. I'll take care of you all. Yeah. I bet you will, you know? And so ended up like <laughs> returning it, but like, I was pissed, man. And it's just like, like, why would you do that? Like, why would you trim a ribeye like that? Well, but people don't like the fat. Well, then they can buy a different cut, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, like what, just stop ruining this stuff because people are idiots and they don't realize you don't have to buy a fatty cut for twice the price. If you don't want a fatty cut, buy the lean cut. It's cheaper anyway, you know? So it's, yeah, it just makes no sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy you took it back. Because yeah, imagine well, if you didn't, I mean, you would have ripped him a, a new one, man. You well, I was pissed, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it was it was a bit annoying, but um, well, cool guys. Well, I think we've been going for about three hours now, so um, I, I don't yeah. want to take up most of your night. You guys are you guys are probably getting late there, so thank you so much for for your time, guys. It was great to meet you and and uh, talk to you face to face. That was absolutely uh, an absolute pleasure. I uh, hopefully have you guys on again sometime. And, uh, you know, maybe do like, like a live sort of thing that we were talking about and, uh, and hear more about, uh, like your trainings and what you guys are doing, uh, uh, you know, currently as well, if you guys are up for it. Definitely. It'd be awesome, man. Thank you, Dr. Chafee. We really appreciate your time and knowledge and, and insight on the diet. And we will continue watching your videos and, and yeah. sharing them as well. This is awesome. Yeah, man. It was amazing. You know, a lot of knowledge. I, I, I love the energy. I love just the information. Just so much to soak in and yeah, man, let's continue. Let's continue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks everyone for, for watching. If you've gotten this far, I appreciate it. Um, where, where can people find your stuff and follow you guys and, and see, uh, see more of your stuff. Instagram SF Ninja. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instagram, uh, Halen Gracie, R H A L A N Gracie. I'm also head instructor here at Ralph Gracie, San Francisco. So if you're ever, in San Francisco, want to get a little jujitsu in, feel free to stop by. Awesome academy, beautiful mat space. Personal trainer right here. If you want to work on your muscles, go to this guy. If you want your mm -hmm. technique refined, come to me. And I heard you used to do a little MMA yourself. So when you're I in did, town, yeah. come stay with us. As long as you know, you're yeah. here, we'll that'd be fun. Training, so welcome to San Francisco anytime. And let me tell you, we make a really good ribeye, bro. So I bet. don't worry, you'll I bet. do with yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Close to the airport. So anytime you're here in San Francisco, call us up, man. We'll come get yeah. you. On. Much Dude, love, that'd man. be awesome, man. I absolutely will. And uh take you up on that. So cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. And uh yeah, we'll hope to do this again soon. All right, Dr. All Shane. Right. Take care, y'all. Brother, have a good one. Uh, aloha. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys. Mm -hmm.